Do you mind if I just rant a bit? Uh, skip to here if you just want to see the rewrite. Okay, so honestly, I sympathize with Isayama. Writing an ending to Attack on Titan is really hard, but it's also hard for the same reason that the climax is incredibly exciting. That is, rather than have a big bad for our heroes to take down, Isayama created this incredibly compelling problem that, because of our main character's inherent character traits, leads them to try to solve that problem in different ways, and that disagreement pits them against each other as mortal enemies. That's a hell of a climax to your story, but it also comes with problems, especially when you get into the specifics. The story basically forces its characters into an impossible choice, where it's either them or the entire outside world, innocence included. With the only plan that minimizes these casualties on both sides requires you sacrifice Historia, a character with royal blood by turning her into a titan shifter, limiting her lifespan to 13 years, and then when that time frame is up, her children have to be next by way of eating their mother alive. So you can save the outside world, but it requires you sacrifice one person on your side, turn them into a breeding machine and then force her children to do the same for the next 50 years. The only way to avoid this outcome is to activate the rumbling, effectively a mega nuke. A powerful but indiscriminate weapon and destroy so much of the outside world that they won't be a threat to you while you make up the massive technological gap between you and the outside world so that you don't have to rely on the rumbling that necessitates you sacrifice Historia. At which point our main character Eren goes fuck it in for a penny in for a pound and just decides to wipe everything clean because he's got like four years left to live, debatably can't access this power again after this if he changes his mind and ultimately wants to guarantee safety to the people he cares about. And there's like also some stuff about like ending the cycle of violence or whatever. Now, I think the exact amount of the rumbling that is, quote, necessary is debatable, but ultimately the story does a very good job of setting up a very compelling moral conflict. It's a hypothetical manifest, an impossible choice. A lot of people get uh, <laughs> kind of antsy about this, but and the ending like kind of changed his mind as well and like patched over this but no the story prior to the ending was unquestionably trying to push you into this choice the story goes out of its way to make these the only options the smartest characters in the show repeatedly say they don't have another answer and spend literally all the time they have looking for one as there are hard limiters put in place by the plot to force the characters to choose and as much as people and the ending retcon Aaron to be an unjustifiable bad guy the story went out of its way beforehand to make Aaron and sympathetic. You see how he doesn't want to do this. You see him debating the ethics of his choice. He has direct contrast with characters like Flock, who revels in killing and demonizing civilians, where Eren hates himself for the civilians he kills and arguably only kills most of them as collateral to get to those who are a threat. Also, on two occasions, the plot literally waits until the last possible second before he acts. When he activates the rumbling, Marley was literally at their gates, trying to kill them at worst and put them in concentration camps at best. And even before that, Eren literally waited until the enemy declared a war before he crossed the point of no return. Isayama was obviously trying to create a morally grey character and choice, and it's great, it's compelling, and it makes for an amazing final conflict, but <laughs> it winds me up when people sidestep this part of the story, as if Attack on Titan hasn't always been about grey morality and nuance, etc. As if the story didn't spend 120 chapters repeatedly telling you that everything isn't black and white only to make the final conflict black and white like how boring is that you know what it reminds me of Avengers Endgame, where a character that was once written sympathetically, written as if they genuinely believe they are doing something horrible but are choosing to do it anyway, believing it to be the only good choice, is suddenly changed to be a straight villain with none of the same nuance. Because that's kind of what Eren is. I never see anyone make this comparison, but it, it's true, he's reverse Thanos, or <laughs> potentially he's <laughs> right-leaning Thanos? Uh, it, it, do you know what I mean? Like Thanos has a collectivist philosophy, whereas Eren has a very individualist philosophy. Again, the whole final conflict is effectively a hypothetical manifest. Are you a bad person for killing innocents if you have to kill them to save yourself? Likewise, Thanos is, are you a bad person for killing innocents if you have to kill them to save a greater number of people? Both of these are pretty simple little hypotheticals, but both are taken to their absolute extreme for a compelling villain. And I'll say the exact same thing I did about Thanos in my endgame video. For these villains to work, they have to be right. Not morally, mind you, you can make your own judgement on that, but their hypothetical needs to be true, that killing is the only way to achieve their goal. 
What makes these villains compelling is that they know what they're doing is horrible and choose to do it anyway. And so logically, the second they're wrong, the second you give them a better way, they'll take it in a heartbeat, which means you don't have a conflict anymore, and you've taken all the weight away from your climax because you've made such a big deal out of something that you were going to deus ex machina. But now, okay, here's the big difference between Eren and Thanos, and this is what makes Attack on Titan's ending so hard to write. Eren is your main character. He's not a villain introduced with the intention of being beaten, motives be damned, Eren is the character we've been following for years as he fought for his freedom. Your audience wants closure, and because Eren's character is defined by his desire for freedom, you can't give him closure by killing him. Don't get me wrong, this end has some value in tragic irony, but it is at the expense of closure, which I think is more important for a long-running series. No, you need closure, and the only way this would count as closure is if Eren believably wanted death, but uh, yeah, that's not fucking happening. <laughs> It's not Code Geass where the main character has a whole mantra about being prepared to die and has a life goal beyond his own freedom. This doesn't work for Eren without a massive retcon, which is what happened. And yes, this was a retcon. I wasn't even someone who originally believed this, I just assumed it was pretty natural for there to be a massive disconnect between author and uh, audience. And when you couple this with the fact that most writers only have practice writing the middle of their story and no practice writing endings, I assume this was a pretty natural outcome. But no, there was there was definitely a retcon. Uh, there's a small YouTuber called Serenity I ran into while researching this video who makes these super high quality videos that completely turned me on this topic. Like three videos alone managed to completely flip me. I mean, we literally know for a fact that the ending was changed at some point, and there was direct contradictions between promotional materials about what the last panel was, but also, there's direct contradictions in interview that contradict both the ending and other later interviews. And the thing that really blew me away was the connections he draws between Attack on Titan and other media to show what Isayama's inspirations were. The Mikasa, Kaska, Eren Griffith comparison, as well as the Eternal Champion, is uncanny. The point of this video isn't really to argue all this, nor is it to provide counter-arguments to what the ending defenders are likely to bring up, but I highly recommend watching Serenity if you want to see more of this side of the argument. He's rather, <laughs> he's rather, um, abrasive, but he is very good. He also takes other ending critiques and gives them better editing, so they're more accessible. So it's a great gateway into this side of the fandom. Anyway, I totally believe it's a retcon, but that being said, you can kind of see why this was a retcon. The popular theory for the original ending is that Eren completes the rumbling and kills his friends, and while I like elements of that, it's logically consistent, solves the climax without a deus ex machina, and keeps Eren's character intact and gives you this insanely climactic end with all the spectacle of a mortal fight between friends and a full rumbling, it's it's also terrible for the closure of your other characters. And while they don't have characterizations that revolve around not dying like Eren does, there's no way you're going to find satisfying deaths to like 11 characters. It's possible for a few maybe, but 11? It's wildly impractical. But then, okay, if you try to keep these characters alive, it doesn't work either, because that implies they're not fighting to the death, which is a waste of spectacle. Plus, Eren's character would presumably get up and keep going until he wins or dies, which you don't want either. In fact, because this is a mortal fight, a core disagreement, it's a character assassination on either side to have them stop unless you can find an organic way to resolve the conflict. But it has to feel climactic and spectacly as well. Yeah. Honestly, it's a, it's a fucking mess. But I think I've got it. So, what's the first thing on the agenda? Alright, so this is going to start off sparse and vague as we do some setup and then get more detailed as we go on. So, okay, one of the major complaints of the ending is how Annie is treated. Given what she's done, it's very incongruent with how characters like Reiner are treated. But rather than just change that to be more equivalent to Reiner, I want to give a specific reason to why it is what it is. So, after the campfire scene on the carriage the next day, I want Annie to question Reiner. So Annie says to Reiner, why do they ignore me? Why do you get it? Reiner says it's because he deserves it more, he did worse things. But Annie, in a surprising moment of kindness, says, you're not really that bad, you just take all the blame. But then it's Yelena who explains that they focus on Reiner because he's weak. They get satisfaction out of him, but trying to guilt Annie is like trying to get blood from a stone. And at worst, it's a threat to the Alliance. Annie averts her gaze, she doesn't respond. Nothing major, just set up for now. Next, I'm going to make a small general change to the dock fight to accent what happens later. 
I want Flock to embody Erwin a little bit more by specifically being able to sacrifice his men, even if it's just something as simple as not defeating the armor and female titan by brute force, but instead by having one group approach the armor and female titan head on and intentionally not aim for the neck or even the boat, small plot fix there, to prevent them from turning around and noticing the small fishing boat floating alongside the port loaded with soldiers that will score a clean thunder spear on the napes. That's all I want to change about the dogfight, outside of some other minor stuff, like old ladies flipping an armed and trained soldier like a sack of potatoes. Yeah! Step on me, Grandma! Sorry, I just wanted to- I wanted to birth that sentence into existence. To me, the real problems start with what comes after, prepping the ship and Hanji's death. In fact, it's pretty obvious when you compare the two scenes. See, I quite enjoy the dock fight with Flock. It's a great build up to the fight before the final conflict. Its antagonist is one with significant investment who's well established already in the plot as an obstacle, and the fight itself creates a ton of great moments, especially in terms of taking these lofty aspirations expressed by some of the characters and really hitting them with the gravity of the situation. They killed their comrades, they get called traitors, and they're forced to face the reality that even if they win, they don't even have answers for their country or themselves. If they win, they've doomed their homeland and murdered murdered people who just wanted to protect themselves from getting wiped out, and if they lose, they've killed them for nothing. No matter how noble this path is, no matter how many more innocent lives you save in exchange, the reality is- That will mean blood on your hands before the thing is done. The blood of my enemies, not the blood of innocents. Now in contrast, Hanji's death and the scenes surrounding it feels quite arbitrary. As a standalone scene, it's engaging, dramatic, and makes sense for a character. But none of it is really interwoven with what comes before or what comes after, and it kind of feels like it's done purely to raise the stakes and make Armin the leader in preparation for his arc's crescendo. I suppose Flock's death speech feels important too, but there's also no reason that couldn't have happened at the dock rather than clinging onto the ship for 24 hours like he ate Zeke off screen and became the fish titan. See, fighting Flock feels meaningful because he's a thinking, breathing character in the world who wants to oppose these characters. But Hanji died to a bunch of mindless titans because the mangaka decided that the timing of the rumbling just happened to clash with them leaving feels arbitrary and after it's said and done, there's nothing that comes of it. The fight with Flock, Connie, John, Reiner were all changed by it. They all had things to talk about, things to resolve. After Hanji died, what happened? Uh, they cried and uh, they, they moved on. <laughs> I mean, what else could they do? Nothing surrounding her death had any significance to anything. So I'm gonna do something different with Hanji to fix this, but that'll come later. But if she's living through this scene, then we have to rework the ship preparing scene. We should still try and keep Flock's last stand, but without Hanji's death, the scene will have to play a different role since it doesn't really have any purpose in the narrative anymore. So here's what's gonna happen. Rather than require them to prepare the plane to fly on the continent, they will instead be able to prepare it on the ship while increasing the flying boat preparation time to get the same timing as the enemy. Or perhaps just increase the speed at which the plane flies and gets in the air so that Flock doesn't have to aquaman it for as long as he did. As it's like, uh, that was a bit of a stretch. So like half a day, meaning they leave partway through the night and we can still have our atmospheric nighttime scenes from the anime. Actually, before we get to the actual crux of this, I'm gonna add an interaction between Mikasa and Kiyomi as they're waiting for the plane. It can start with small talk about the flying boat or whatever, but when Mikasa says the word flying boat, Kiyomi chuckles at the name. She apologizes and explains that the flying boat is actually just the name they use to make it easy for the Eldians. Among her and the Hizuru engineers, they actually refer to it as dragon, which is of course a totally foreign word to Mikasa. Kiyomi explains dragons are a creature in Hizuru mythology. They are gods of water, but are capable of flight. This is actually, I think, fairly accurate to some of the Japanese dragons, but Kiyomi pulls out a fan from her kimono. Doesn't actually wear a kimono at this point, but whatever. Decorated with a picture of dragon and says that they are symbols of beauty, wisdom, and peace. She contrasts it with a flying boat, a large hunk of metal, and adds that it's not quite befitting of the title, is it? but that's what I wanted it to be. Something that spreads peace and knowledge and guides us into a new age. It's a pity how things turned out. Mikasa lightens to this, admitting that maybe she was wrong about Kiyomi. When I first met you, I thought you were selfish. Kiyomi admits that Mikasa is more correct than she thinks. She let short-term gain blind her. Maybe if Hizuru openly put its full weight behind Eldia, then the rumbling wouldn't have happened. The truth is, I never believed in Eldia's future. We just wanted the resources to guarantee our own with as little risk as possible. But this is the price I pay for my selfishness. Even if we stop the rumbling in time, I imagine my poor dragon will have been smashed to pieces. But that's only fair. In the end, I don't think I honored its namesake. Mikasa says that she shouldn't blame herself. Yelena said that all of this suffering came because of the power of the Titans and Mikasa agrees with her. It was the imbalance of power. If they just got rid of it, maybe they could live in peace. 
But Kiyomi says, are you sure about that? The whole reason we came to Paradis was the Ice Burst Stone, the valuable resource exclusive to Paradis. With 50 years of research, it may have surpassed not only the Titans, but the technology of other countries. If Titans vanished now, all of that Ice Burst Stone would have gone to Mali, and if Titans vanished in 50 years, Paradis and Hizuru would have become superpowers instead. It's naive to think that the curse of the Titan is the source of our problems. The Titans are just power, and you can't destroy power you can only ever change its owner. After a moment of silence, Mikasa finally opens up a little and asks her, what happens if I can't stop him? Kiyomi instead asks if she loves him, but she remains silent. Kiyomi sighs, thinks, and eventually relents. If the rumbling destroys Hizuru, Mikasa will be one of the few things left of her home. If Mikasa brings Eren back, Kiyomi will just have to learn to make peace with him. Mikasa tears up. For the longest time, it's felt like no one has been sympathetic to her feelings for Eren. Mikasa, now grateful to Kiyomi, looks back at the flying boat and says, If nothing else, I promise I'll do everything I can to return the dragon to Hizuru. But Kiyomi replies, Don't be silly. All I care about is you. This is sort of a strange scene to add, but it's going to make sense later and fix another problem, being that Mikasa and her relationship with Hizuru felt like a drop plot line that went nowhere. Kiyomi and the engineers just seem to exist to get the alliance to the rumbling, after which point they're just effectively left on a boat, along with Yelena, don't even get me started on that. But in my rewrite, there'll be their own plot point that needs to be tied up, as well as being crucial to Mikasa's endgame. Moving on, with the ship that's heading to the rumbling, they don't get ahead of the rumbling like the original, they're still behind it. This was something that really confused me the more I thought about it. How the Alliance get in front of the rumbling? I, I always thought the rumbling started in Paradis and moved out in an expanding circle, so in order to get ahead of the rumbling they had to pass through a line of Colossal Titans, which they obviously can't and didn't do off screen. The only way I can make sense of it is that the rumbling split into groups and only targeted the continents, allowing the Alliance ship to slip between, but then it's like, if they can do that, why didn't everyone with a ship do that? There's tons of them in the lore, the rumbling would have been escaped way too easily, and the fact that we don't see anyone doing it makes it seem like no one thought of that. Of course, none of the rumbling particularly made sense anyway. The size of the walls and Paradis' comparative size to the rest of the world means there's nowhere near enough Titans for a full rumbling to work. Maybe the idea is the rumbling was supposed to make multiple laps around the planet, but then we're led to believe that 80% of the world died by the time Mali was rumbled. But Mali is the closest continent to Paradis, so it can't have gotten that far despite all of the cultures we saw get rumble. I don't know, either way, I've got a half decent solution to all of this that we'll get to in time, as well as a corresponding plot twist that I'll be using this new plane prepping scene to foreshadow. So okay, the Alliance are behind the rumbling, heading to the continent. The Mikasa and Kiyomi stuff has happened and everyone's had their same conversations as they do in the original, including Armin and Annie's conversation, plus briefly seeing Child Eren in pass. The plane is almost ready to go, everything is going fine, but then, on the horizon, steam. They couldn't have caught up to the rumbling, could they? No, the rumbling already hit Mali, then, then the only explanation is it's coming back towards them. The Titans are coming back. Suddenly, the plane is their only hope for survival. The Hizuru engineers are willing to sacrifice themselves for the cause, but Armin wants to bring Annie, Gabby, and Falco, who were meant to stay behind, but Gabby and Falco are locked up like in the original. To stop them from risking their lives, ironically, locking them up has now put them in danger. Immediately, they slow the ship down and turn it around to buy time, and Armin sends Annie to get the two kids, but turning the ship around gives Flock, who's been clinging on for dear life, the ability to pull himself up, and when he sees why the ship is turned, he realizes now is the best time to strike. Flock appears and shoots the craft. He's heavily injured by Mikasa, similar to the original, and starts to bleed out, but not immediately, so he's disarmed instead. Flock says, Bad luck. Our devil is watching. He gave me the perfect opportunity. The engineers assess the damage. The fuel tank has holes in it, but this time, in this version, there's no time to fix it and fill it up. And so there's only one way to reach their destination by plane. They can't weld it up, so they must drop weight instead. They immediately do some quick mess. They take Yelena and the bombs off. They can make it, but not if they add any extra weight. Armin is distraught. At the very least, he wants to save Gabby and Falco, but this is already pushing the wait and time limit. The Hizuru engineers protest. They're willing to throw away their lives to save their home country, but they can't risk it on three extra passengers, who weren't even going to fight. 
Also, Yelena, who was planning to go on the plane, has to be restrained. I'll come back to this later. Hanji is willing to sacrifice herself to give them time, but with nothing to use her theory maneuver gear on, it's not an option. She's desperately trying to think of a way to save people. Armin is the same and says he'll use his Titan to hold them off when they get closer, but it's at this point Flock speaks up, his tone melancholic but vindicated. I was right about you. He begins to criticize Armin. He's unwilling to even sacrifice people who weren't even going to fight. He won't sacrifice anyone even when he's forced to, let alone as part of a plan. Armin is only ever willing to sacrifice himself. Is that your only trick? You false martyrs. I see you for what you are. Cowards. Flock says he was always right about Armin. He's no devil. Erwin was the right choice. Flock then begins to collapse from the blood loss, and Hanji gets everyone's attention. There's a bigger problem. The Titan steam has gotten closer, much closer than expected, meaning these Colossal Titans are way faster than normal Colossals. On closer inspection, these Colossal Titans have shed a lot of their weight, evaporating into steam, becoming gaunt, but fast. In fact, side note, this is actually the same kind of Colossal Titans the audience will see rumbling through all other cultures except Mali more gaunt and spread apart, relying on hot steam to kill more than stomping. Also, this is a good time to mention that I'm playing up the Eldians seeing Ymir out the corner of their eyes, especially when it comes to scenes of the rumbling. This happened once with Ramsay in the middle, but we never got a clear answer on why. But I'll be giving it an actual direct reason along with establishing it as a trend. Ymir is always watching. Even here on the boat, our main characters keep catching her out of the corner of their eyes, but for now, they just think they're imagining it. Cause like, no one knows who the fuck this little girl is anyway. At any rate, uh, so a group of Titans are now heading back towards the ship from Mali, and they've now just realized they're much faster than the usual Colossals. Suddenly, there's no time. Annie will never get back with Gabby and Falco. The flying boat has to go now. And for as good a strategist as Armin and Hanji are, when forced to sacrifice others from themselves, their idealism holds them hostage. Jean, who seems to best understand the reality of what they're doing, sees this and takes charge, and with the help of Levi, drags Armin and Hanji onto the plane as the engines start up. When Armin gets dragged past Flock, he grabs Armin's leg, his voice starting to fade and his anger mellowing as the blood loss sets in. He says his original line, You can't. Everyone on the island will die. Our devil is our only hope. Flock lets go and they hop aboard. Hanji says her line from the original, but more frustratedly. It's as you said, Flock, but I can't just give up. Even if it's hopeless today, maybe someday. Armin is distraught as the engines warm and the plane begins to move. It takes off and Flock, left on the deck, deliriously mumbles as if Armin is still there. He says, it's strange though. Now I know who he is. There must have been a better reason, right? That that devil chose you. This was something that really bothered me about the direction of Armin. Armin post time skip is admittedly pretty useless, but the story acknowledges this, and when he tells Mikasa he was the wrong choice, I was super excited for how that was going to be expanded on, but it ultimately failed to give an interesting answer to why he was useless and thus how he finds his true role in the story. What ends up happening is that he just gets better, becomes worthy of that choice, and then saves the day without really any sort of arc or internal logic. But I propose something different for Armin. Armin shouldn't replace Ermin, and he explicitly can't for a very specific reason. He can't sacrifice his comrades, he has too much heart, which is exactly why he was useless post time skip. He was up against Eren. In fact, Eren used that against him to force him to act, which is also the only time he was capable of even killing innocents, when his comrades were on the line. Other than that, he's been too soft. For all his talk of throwing away humanity in season 1, once he was in a position to make that choice, he didn't have it in him. All he wanted to do was talk. Even at the dock, he didn't kill a single one of his comrades. So if he can't replace Erwin, what's his role in the ending? What is being foreshadowed when Eren says, Armin will save humanity? Back to the rewrite. The Titans are closing in, the plane is flying off, Armin screams back at the ship as he watches Annie, Gabby, and Falco appear on the deck and quickly get forced below by the others before whoosh, the ship is engulfed in scalding steam. Flock's body burns to ashes. When the flying boat disappears out of sight, the steam finally dissipates, and the ship is fine. The Titans never surfaced, they just went past, and after a moment everyone on board comes back after taking refuge from the steam. They're safe. Flock was wrong. 
Eren didn't send those Titans to kill them. So then, what were they doing? Back on the flying boat, Jean confronts Hanji, grabbing her by the collar. He's angry that she refused to cut her losses and go. He didn't come along with the Alliance knowing how suicidal this mission was just to half ass it. The last thing they need is a captain who half asses it. This, of all missions, was the one that requires sacrifices. And if she can't take that responsibility, then she should make him the commander and he will do it instead. Hanji is forced to admit Flock was right and she shares the exact same weaknesses as Armin that makes both of them unsuitable for command. So she proposes a different solution, and puts Jean in a joint role with her. Jean will keep as many people alive as possible and keep the mission moving forward, while Hanji will work with Armin to make clever strategies. It's a bit of a hodge job not having one core commander, but they have to play to their strength. Forced to reckon with his failure, Armin asks Jean how he could do what he couldn't. Jean says that he was just following Armin's advice. He gave up on his humanity to defeat monsters. Armin says, I'm such a hypocrite. For all my words, I just don't have it in me. Jean tells him it's okay. Just focus on what you're good at. I have a lot of Jean moments in this, but him taking a more assertive role and embracing the role that he's on occasion been given, I felt was a good way to keep his character proactive, especially when we're giving Armin a different role. This also plays into a concept of not high mining your alliance, which I'll talk about in a bit. They take a moment to process what they've learnt. There's a moment of horror as they realise they'll never be able to stop the rumbling if the Titans were going that fast. But according to Peek, who saw the rumbling, the Titans were neither that fast nor that gaunt or spread out when she saw them leave the island. Also, the fact that she could still see the steam from the coast means they've maintained that form in Mali, so there may still be a chance. Meanwhile, on the ship, Annie theorises that there must have been a threat to Paradis that required sending some Titans back. They just got caught up in it. So, from here, we connect back up with the original with the characters on the flying boat. We're keeping this generally the same, including Connie coming to understand Reiner, and the Alliance thinking Eren wants to be stopped because their Titan powers still work. Their battle plans, along with the targeting Zeke, also remains the same. Everything except the bombs which are still on the ship. What I am getting rid of is Eren dragging them into paths to say, No, fuck you. <laughs> I always thought this scene was like a little clunky. Something about Eren always listening and only having a conversation just to say we're not going to have a conversation is a little weird. Like, you might as well. It's, it's right there. I feel... <laughs> I feel like this was just kind of rushed to get to the meat. In this version though, Eren isn't watching them nor does he pull them into pass, nor is he keeping their titan's powers active because of some bullshit exoteric freedom shit despite, despite what the characters think. That always felt like such a contrived reason to actually have a final conflict in the story. Oh sure, you're willing to take away the freedoms of billions of people by killing them, but physically restricting them so you can kill them? Oh no, that's going too far. Eren's very principled, you see. <laughs> It's not like his only principle is, if you try to take my freedom, I will take yours, which is exactly what the Alliance are trying to do. <sighs> anyway, so we're keeping everything else, just not this. Meanwhile, back at the boat, after shitting themselves about almost dying to the Titans, we again have the same conversations. Yes, even Falco's dream and his conclusion about being able to fly. Here's where it's different though. Firstly, along with the dream, Falco actually flashes into paths briefly and sees through Zeke's eyes in path with his sandcastle. Zeke can like talk to himself or something so Falco knows who it is. This all sets up him working out the Beast Titan connection, as well as establishing Zeke's sandcastle, because we'll need it later, believe it or not. The other addition is that uh, Annie thinks Falco's theory uh, about having the Beast Titan traits through drinking his spinal fluid is fucking stupid. But then it works. This was another one of the more contrived things when this happened in the manga. I first I thought this was like a red herring, like Falco's being dumb, like an optimistic kid, but his dreams are alluding to something else that will help them. I mean, the whole story you've established the nine Titan shifters and their unique traits. You're telling me Marley didn't realize they could min-max their Titans by just giving them spinal fluid from other Titans? I mean, like technically they did, right? That was what the hardening was implied to be. And the story definitely foreshadowed the female Titan ad like adapting elements. But like, the Jaw Titan can specifically grab elements from past Beast Titans just because it was Beast Titan Spinal Fluid and that, that never came up before with any of the Jaw Titans? Like in all their experimentations? Wasn't the Titan Serum supposed to be Shift of Spinal Fluid anyway? Wouldn't they have found this out automatically? Yeah, I don't know, it's a bit of a stretch. Now all this being said, in this rewrite, I'm not actually going to get rid of this. Falco can still become a Flying Titan. It's just his explanation for it that's wrong. 
that's the only thing that really needed changing. A flying titan is a cool idea, and when you're doing rewrites, you really gotta be careful about cutting. A lot of people just go, this is stupid, get rid of it. This is stupid, cut it. But when you change anything from any writer worth their salt, there's usually an engagement benefit and goal to every decision they've made. Even if it's just as simple as pretty colors and spectacle. And if you're only focused on a couple of engagement goals and disregard things like pretty colors and spectacle, you're gonna end up with something that makes sense, sure, uh, but it's gonna be boring. Often the challenge in writing is doing both. The more you aim for any specific engagement, the harder it is to keep it logically tied to the rest of the narrative. But challenging yourself to do that and getting it right is what the top percentile of writing is. You can't cut out all the explosions because they don't make sense, you gotta rewrite the story to facilitate the explosions. Can I do that though? I don't know, we'll see. Finally, I want Yelena to participate in the Falco Flying Zeke Titan Spinal Fluid Theory scene. That was a long fucking scene. Anyway, I want her to do everything in her power to persuade Kiyomi and Annie to investigate this option. She could even make false claims about Zeke and the Beast Titan to reinforce Falco's wild theory. She is of course just doing all of this because all she cares about is seeing how this ends. This was one of the things that really infuriated me. I love Yelena's character. And when she told McGarth that she was determined to see how this ends, I was so excited to see where it would go. What an exciting, proactive decision for a character who's already lost. Zeke was the right choice and you rejected him, so I'm gonna follow you to the ends of the earth just to watch this decision blow up in your face. Especially with her already being a character centered around her fanaticism and wanting to bear witness to something great. Having her effectively be a determined spectator is so fun. And then Isiaba stuck her in a fucking boat and forgot about her in like direct contradiction to what she said. Like, like what the fuck? She should have been on that flying boat in a heartbeat. So once Falco gets that bird, she's coming too. Anyway, now we proceed to the final battle. First off, we're doing a slight design change to Eren's founding titan. That being, it's covered in camouflaging Warhammer cords and Ymir's titans will have short cords that go nowhere. You'll see why in a bit. Also, some of the titans won't quite match up with any of the nine shifters of the past. It's like Ymir, with her newfound freedom, is starting to experiment and push the limits. As in the original, Ymir baits them with the Zeke clone, and upon landing they realize finding, capturing, or talking to Eren isn't an option, so Jean tells Armin to transform. But just like the original, Armin is captured. With no other options, Jean focuses the scouts on getting him back. But then, the Elder Titans appear. It seems like they're doomed, but Jean steals them. Whatever death awaits them, it's better than living knowing that we didn't try. Stand proud and put your all into this. You chose this path knowing the risks, just as you did when you joined the survey corps long ago. Nothing has changed. The odds were always next to zero. Dedicate your hearts. But, much to their surprise, they make progress rescuing Armin. Connie even says to himself, isn't this a little easy? Jean says not to jinx it, but Hanji says he's right. She's pretty sure these Titans' reaction times are slower, but just then, Ymir is seen out of the corner of their eyes and things begin to get more intense. The Elder Titan's reaction time speeds up. Furthermore, the Titans themselves seem to change and get more terrifying and untitan like as Ymir pushes the bounds even more. It starts to become like nightmare fuel, albeit a lot of the Titans fail and don't function properly as Ymir pushes the bounds, seemingly giving the Alliance a few lucky breaks and near misses with death. The result of all this is that Armin is rescued, but they're all left precariously hanging. They're about to be finished off. Jean orders Armin to blow up, even with his friends around. Armin, infuriated with his own failure, finally steals himself. But when he bites, nothing happens. I can't do it. I just can't sacrifice you. It seems like everything is lost. Mikasa makes her last stand, but in the nick of time, Falco saves the day. This of course is a massive shock to everyone because they thought they were dead. They explain what happened and Armin makes the same theory Annie did, theorizing that Eren sent some titans back to protect Paradis from something. Hanji is preoccupied by something else, namely, what the fuck Falco, how can you already fly? Not only is a flying titan unprecedented, especially under these circumstances, but it's baffling he'd learned how to fly in one try. Falco doesn't know, plus he can't speak. Anyway, they stipulate more about what to do next. After Armin botched his transformation, Peek says there's no guarantee Armin will be able to transform even if it's just Eren he risks killing. But that's okay, cause she never cared about Eren. 
Falco has brought the bombs with him, and so Peek disconnects the bombs and jumps onto Eren to wrap it around his neck, despite everyone telling her to wait, all except Jean who agrees with Peek and holds them back. Even if Eren's not in the head, they can at least take out his eyes and slow the founder from rumbling the people on Fort Salta. Also note that the head is mostly free of Elder Titans because they moved away following the Alliance before Falco showed up. This gives Peek her opportunity. This was like a really good moment for Peek that I wanted to keep. As I hinted to you before, when you make an alliance like this in storytelling, you never want to fully hive mind them. What makes a plot interesting is that you have all these different gears, i.e. characters and plot devices that have their own rules. Seeing those rules constantly engaged to create unique outcomes is what makes a plot feel deep. If you combine your characters into a hive mind, you ruin the complexity of the plot. Uh, if you've ever seen Ranking of Kings, uh, amazing example of this. I've never seen a show 100 to 0 itself so quickly because of all these clashing gears uniting into one conglomerate by the end of the season. Did you know season 2 came out? Yeah, no one was fucking talking about it because the plot lost all its interest. Anyway, I'm actually going to be playing this non-hive mindedness up as we go on, you'll see. Anyway, Jean gets everyone to follow Peek and focus on blowing up the neck. He doesn't have any clever strategies and he doesn't even know if Eren is in the neck, but at the very least they can take out his eyes and they can slow the founder from reaching Fort Salta. So that's their priority. He also sends Falco and Gabby to pick up supplies from the crashed plane before flying below the founder to operate as a flying base. Gabby and eventually Onyonkapon, when he's picked up, will help resupply gas and replace broken parts, as well as keep an eye out to catch anyone who falls. It also gives the fighters an option to intentionally fall from the founder as a last resort to escape bad situations. This was sort of a minor thing, but all the nitty gritty details of battles in Attack on Titan was disregarded in the Battle of Heaven and Earth. Remember running out of gas, minor injuries, broken parts, protecting the horses, flares and information? These little rules made battles feel real, and it's one of the reasons the Battle of Heaven and Earth feels like Hollywood and not something more tightly written. Anyway, Armin says he will drop first on a separate location and try one more time to blow everything up. But again, it doesn't work. Deep down, he doesn't want to kill Eren. Mikasa follows him up for backup and everyone else drops near the head to back up Peek. Peek, who goes to blow up the neck, says her Vanish Nightmare line, amazing fucking line by the way, but just as in the original, Peek is stabbed by the Warhammer, who seemed to have been hiding underneath the founder and has just now come up for some reason. Armin and Mikasa catch up with the group just to see Peek run out and bite the Warhammer's nape before moving on to the others, but the Warhammer repairs and is still active, and the Alliance notice something. It's the only one with a Warhammer coil they can't see the end of. It's Eren. That's why there's so many loose Warhammer coils. They're camouflaging Eren's location. The coil seems to lead all the way back down to the end of the Titan. Armin says if they follow the coil, they can capture or kill Eren. But Jean says it's a suicide to follow it all the way into all the Elder Titans where it seems to be leading. But Armin says he'll take responsibility. His failure is still eating him up. Besides, he says, if blowing up the neck doesn't work, they'll have no leads. The coil is now disintegrating, so there won't be a chance to change their minds and follow it later. And then, Armin starts to think. He realizes something. Jean smiles and says he knows that face. Welcome back, Armin. Armin says, it's just a hunch. But he calls for Hanji and they begin following the disintegrating coil. Armin says to Hanji, hey, do you feel like you keep seeing a random girl out of the corner of your eye? And Hanji says, I don't know, maybe, why? Armin tells Hanji how weird it is that Eren came out to defend the neck. He risked his location when he could have used the other founding titans. Why? Is it possible that the Elder Titans are controlled by a different will than Eren? I don't know, maybe that's crazy. But Hanji backs him up. She noticed the Titans' reaction time was slower, and it got quicker when Connie pointed it out. Also, Falco's Titan makes no sense, nor the fact he mastered it so easily. It's like someone is helping us, but doesn't want us to know. It brought us the explosives on Falco, right? And Eren only revealed himself because he felt like the neck wasn't properly defended, right? So this will wants us to blow up the neck? More importantly, it doesn't want them following this coil, says Armin, watching the growing number of titans trying to get in their way from chasing it. So then could this coil be going to the second will? No. Why have a titan with a coil if they can control them remotely? The elder titans must be the second will defending Eren. Perhaps Eren is just protecting his head because he needs his sight to assault Fort Salta and monitor the rumbling. I doubt he'd hide somewhere so obvious. Hanji's like, so then what the hell does this thing want? Is it helping us or not? Armin says, 
All we know is it doesn't want us knowing Aaron's real location, it doesn't want us dead, it wants us to blow up the nape, but most importantly, it didn't want us knowing any of this. Which means it wants us to believe our first assumption, which is blowing up the nape will kill Aaron and stop the rumbling. But if Aaron's not there, there's no reason to think this would stop the rumbling. So, that implies that this is some form of trick. Anji goes to tell the others, but Armin says wait. Armin says that as long as they have time, they shouldn't play right into its hands. Nothing has changed since Shiganshina. They need to be a step ahead. So, let's put pressure on this second wheel instead. If it doesn't want Eren dead, let's pressure on that to force it to give us a real way to stop the rumbling. And with that, they form a plan. Hanji turns back and says she's taking back command. She directly tells the scouts to stop targeting the neck, instead split up and start looking for the rest of the coil in case it doubles back. Look for the longest coil, she says. Meanwhile, Armin and Mikasa start to follow the coil. It eventually wraps back around and starts to go back, but they lose it and get caught up in a fight. But Hanji's group picks it up as it heads back to the head. They get cut off too, but only on its exact position, so at least they know Eren's general area. Hanji thinks that if they get Armin to blow up that area though, they'll be able to kill Eren. Armin just needs to be able to steal himself, he needs the motivation to kill Eren. She stares into the Titans more and steals herself. Last chance, she says, give us another way to stop the rumbling, or else, and jumps directly into the Titan's mouth, forcing Emir to commit to killing her. Meanwhile, Armin and Mikasa are trapped. Falco comes to the rescue and they jump onto him, right as Hanji goes into the mouth, and suddenly, Hanji and Armin find themselves in paths. So this all solves four problems. One, there is an immense amount of plot armor in this fight. I like the spectacle of the Elder Titans, but surviving this is a stretch in a series that's defined by its realistic brutality. So instead, we've turned it into a trick. The fight can still be tense and look like the Titans are really gonna go for them, but we add in the caveat that they're holding back enough to avoid lethal damage. Risking killing them, but never directly intending to allowing to look like a lethal fight where they're truly doomed before we pull this mid-fight twist. Two, the way into paths made no sense. The original really tries to have it both ways without actually setting up the logic to make it possible. Emir's titans are seemingly really trying to kill them, and yet Emir captures Armin to stop him from blowing up, only to help him so that he can blow up after forcefully being freed by the Alliance, presumably against Emir's will. It's very muddled, but here it's much simpler. Once they work it out, Emir has two clear objectives that operate very consistently, and at the very least for the start of this battle we maintain the tension. Three, the way into paths felt very unearned. This is related to the last point, but because Armin's way into paths is because he was captured, it feels more like he won because he lucked out than because he outsmarted Eren. I was actually gonna do this myself with having Ymir give them a way to stop the rumbling, but not only does this make Ymir kinda silly given her true intentions, which we haven't gotten to, but once I realized that, I figured I could use the context clues to have Armin realize Ymir's existence and exploit her, so that way getting into paths and finding a real way to stop the rumbling is on him. And finally, four, the way that paths worked was retconned. Uh, when we're introduced to paths, the real world is effectively time stop. That's how one little girl could build all these titans for everyone. But in the Battle of Heaven and Earth, time passes while Armin is in paths. Okay, well, anyway. so. Emir pulls Armin and Hanji into pass. Remember when I said uh, Falco sees Zeke and he has that small sandcastle in front of him? Well, now it's a full-blown castle inside pass that Hanji and Armin find themselves walking through. And it's not just sand either. Just like the chains of pass, these are real things and it establishes that anyone in pass can use the sand to make whatever they want. Anyway, they find Zeke on the throne with the same look of the false king of the walls. Good little parallel there since a fake king is effectively what Zeke became. Hanji and Armin still think that killing Zeke will stop the rumbling, so they try to convince Zeke to die for them. They're like, hey, Levi's out there, don't you want revenge? But Zeke explains killing him won't work. The Titans are made by Ymir. She's just a girl and the royal blood is bunk. That's why even the way the Titans have looked and functioned has changed with her will. Honestly, she probably only chose to even make Titans because it was the form she thought best suited the king. But now all those restrictors are now removed. This is all happening because she wants it to and Zeke has no control. This was another one of the baffling things. Ymir was shown to be just a human, enslaved and traumatized to the point where she felt like following orders was her only option. After Eren told her it's okay to choose, royal blood should mean nothing, and yet killing Zeke 
works? I don't know, man. No, they need a new way to stop the rumbling. Zeke, of course, wasn't going to leave anyway. He's depressed. He says there's no point in anything anymore. Without the euthanasia plan, we are all doomed. But Hanji, in direct contrast to Zeke, is anything but nihilistic. She gushes over the lore dump she just got about how Paths works and how the Titans work. In fact, she starts putting things together. She says, that explains why shifters must have a goal to transform. It's a request to Emir. Zeke's like, I'm telling you it's hopeless and you're gritting, but Haji is like, we have infinite time here, right? Where's the harm in completing my research? And Zeke says, how can you find this fast? fun. Hanji is surprised he doesn't have a passion for titan science, but Zeke says that was just a means to an end. I don't have passions in general. Hanji says, you're miserable, it's no wonder you came up with the euthanasia plan. And Zeke goes on with his usual nihilistic shit about how humans exist to reproduce, yada yada. But Armin suggests it's more than fun. Maybe Ymir wants them to work something out. It can't be a coincidence Ymir chose to show these two to Zeke. Hanji agrees. Much of her research doesn't make sense now and now needs to be recontextualized. Once they do, they might have an answer. As I said, the big problem I had with Hanji's death is her sacrifice feels relatively meaningless. If there's one part of it I really liked, it was Hanji looking over the Titans and saying they really are beautiful. It's a great callback to what makes Hanji Hanji, but it's still lacking in a lot of that narrative weight. The better way to do this is have Hanji be instrumental to stopping the rumbling via her vast amount of info and passion for Titans. It also gives us a chance to reveal a lot of the mysteries and mysterious mechanics that have underpinned the whole series, and through Hanji's excitement, her characterization, we can motivate Zeke in a much more natural way. Zeke's redemption is rather cheap. It's crazy to think little moments have value because they're fun would be a thought that would never have occurred to Zeke, much less one that would completely turn and motivate him to sacrifice himself. But I think we can use the same logic to evoke a more sensible reaction. Just keep in mind, as this conversation goes on, Hanji's passion is getting Zeke's gears turning. So the first question Hanji sets out to answer is, if Titans are all made from Ymir by sand and transferred through past during an infinite realm, why is there limits on transformation and redemption? generation. Ymir couldn't have gotten bored or tired, not in a time stop world, and Zeke had the same issues despite his royal blood. So Hanji thinks, hang on, who's been shown to have power to control Titans? Just Titan shifters, right? But not normal Eldians, even if they have royal blood. Given what Zeke said about Ymir, it would make no sense why she would only listen to shifters with royal blood. She doesn't even listen to pure Titans with royal blood. What makes the shifters special? Zeke thinks about it and says his history of Eldia that Grisha drilled into him states that Ymir split her soul into nine titans. Perhaps that was more literal than first thought. Hanji asks, is there nine Ymirs? But Zeke says there's only one, so perhaps each shifter has one ninth of influence over the real Ymir. Hanji says that would explain why they still have control over their titans, but Armin says that might just be because Ymir wants them to. After all, one ninth would not outweigh eight ninths. That said, five ninths would, and they have five titan shifters. But wait, if it works like that, wouldn't it be possible to stop the rumbling just by getting at least five titan shifters to make an order at the same time? Zeke says, no, it can't be that simple. Molly would have discovered that ages ago. Hanji thinks before something hits her and she goes into a ramble. It's because your orders are obfuscated by paths. Every shifter has access to one ninth of Ymir, but because that ninth is in paths with the real Ymir, you have to communicate your order through paths, which is difficult. That's why you have no control when you first transform, and why you can do more with practice. It's the user getting better at giving orders across paths. The difficulty would also explain how you exhaust your power by using it too much. Likewise, any injury makes giving an order much harder. I bet that's what made the Founding Titan and Royal Blood so powerful. It's the one Titan Ymir created to directly answer to. So if you have Royal Blood, Ymir would willingly bring you into paths so you could directly make orders. It even explains why the coordinate remained active when Eren first activated it, but then wore off. Communicating through paths was intuitive to Eren after it happened so recently, but after a bit of time passed, he lost his groove and forgot it, so it became much harder. Likewise, I bet making orders around your own Titan is easier both because you're closer and more familiar and much more connected to your Titan, but also because that's how Ymir designed and intended them to be used, meaning the orders are more familiar and sensical to her. Oh, oh, being hurt must be like a jumpstart. You hurt yourself, you hurt Ymir, she senses your urgency, and it helps get your orders across. 
Oh, oh, and when you put Spinal Serum from Shifter into a subject, it both hurts them and puts a bit of Ymir inside them from a Shifter that desired a transformation. That's why they transform and why Zeke requires Serum to control his Titans. Then, Zeke actually laughs, cause Hanji has worked out some of their methods. Yes, when they extract spinal fluid, the shifter needs to have a strong will about what it's going to be used for, just like when they transform. Hanji then realizes, that explains the armored serum in the cave in season 3. Yes, I'm filling in that plot convenience. A previous armored titan put the serum in a bottle intending to give his hardening to someone else. Hanji says, that's how you and Annie got hardening powers, isn't it? Zeke confirms. Hanji says that this is good then. All of this indicates that it's possible for you to use your ninth of Ymir to influence Titans. Zeke says that her obfuscation theory makes a lot of sense, but then why did the hardening takes to some of the nine Titans better than others? The Cart, Colossal, and even the Jaw Titan couldn't adapt the crystal hardening from the Armored Titan. Hanji says that maybe because the Cart, Jaw, and Colossal are too physically different from the Armored Titan that the serum came from. Two are bipedal and one is way too big. And then, Armin's eyes widen. He's the Colossal Titan. The rumbling is all Colossal Titans. Maybe it is possible for them to stop the rumbling, at the very least in theory. At the very least, the obfuscation of pass between him and his targets should be virtually non-existent. Hanji says, can we think of any other logic that supports that, where physical similarities between the shifter and the target affected control? And Zeke is reminded of a moment all the way back in Season 2, where the smallest and most disproportionate Titan refused to follow his orders. They start to get excited, but Zeke stops them. I could only do it all because I had royal blood, and besides, you'd need to get serum into every colossal titan. Getting serum into targets was the most important part of his control. Hanji says it makes sense. It's probably easy to get your part of Ymir to do things or fudge the rule if you had royal blood. And then her eyes widen. Oh, that explains Rod's massive titan and why he didn't need a proper injection to transform. The serum gave him a piece of Ymir and the royal blood did the rest. Oh, oh, says Hanji. Then this all explains your moon titans, doesn't it? We assumed sunlight was a biological need, but perhaps that was wrong. Perhaps it was just an order. Zeke confirms, saying that when things are undefined, Emir seems to use the person being transformed as inspiration. Just like their appearance, their behaviors are also a reflection of what they were like as humans. That's what aberrants are, but the behaviors can be applied even all the way down to their sleep pattern. So all I had to do was order them to not sleep at night, says Zeke. I imagine the rumbling colossals are under a similar order. Again though, you don't have royal blood or serum in your targets. But Hanji says not having royal blood might not be an issue for us with the five ninths of Ymir giving the same order. Perhaps if they were to give Armin spinal fluid to each of the shifters and had them transform with the intention of helping Armin, he may be able to leverage their ninths of Ymir in unition which would outweigh the majority of Ymir's will. It wouldn't give them power equivalent to the Founder because they still had to overcome the obfuscation of Paz, but they might be able to use the power similar to Zeke if the order is easy enough. Which shouldn't be too hard, with the Colossals being almost identical to Armin. Getting the serum into the Colossal Titans is a much trickier hurdle though, but whatever, let's keep going, see what else we can learn. They think for a bit on what to tackle next, and Armin asks Zeke about the Ackermans and what Eren told him and Mikasa. Zeke says Eren gave the theory to him too, but it didn't align with Marley's current research. But then it occurred to him that Eren must have gotten the idea from the memories of the previous attack titan, so perhaps Marley knew but kept the information confidential. It wasn't until he started digging that he found the truth. The Ackerman family was an Eldian Empire titan science or Marley titan science. They're the product of giving an Eldian the attack titan's spinal fluid. So as established in the story, the Attack Titan rejects the will of the Founder, it always does its own thing. You wanna know why? You wanna know why Ackermans are immune to the Founder? It's because the Ackerman family was the followers or descendants of the followers of the Attack Titan given his serum, but unlike normal serum that made them pure Titans or Royal Titan serum that made them controllable, Attack Titan serum did the opposite. They gave them the qualities of the Titan, but made them uncontrollable by anyone, including the founder and the attack titan itself. The catch is, those powers can only be awakened by true loyalists. Eren's assumption was incorrect. It's not that they're slaves, it's that only those who could never kill who they are loyal to could become awakened Ackermans. 
This whole idea of the Attack Titan gets Hanji thinking. It's interesting that one particular ninth of Ymir is immune to the Founder. Zeke says that Akamans are probably only immune to the Founding Titan, not Ymir herself. The Nine Titans are probably not just nine separate parts, but something more like specific parts of her psyche. The Founding Titan, for instance, is probably her consciousness and allows direct communication with Ymir without the obfuscation of paths. But the Attack Titan is her will that remained uncontrollable, always moving to what Ymir wanted deep down. Perhaps that's why Emir split herself like she did. It was because of her unconscious desire for something she didn't feel like she was allowed to have. Of course, this is all fascinating to Hanji. Then that means all the other Titans are aspects of her. Warhammer is her creativity, Colossal is her strength, the Beast is her instinct, Jaw is desire or craving, Armor is her loyalty, Ka is her endurance, Female is her passion, femininity, or perhaps it's her body, and that's why it's so good at adaption. Throughout all of this, Zeke's been kind of mesmerized by Hanji's passion for Titans. He finally zones out, looking at Hanji, until he blurts out, Baseball. Huh? You asked about my passions. Baseball was my passion. He looks more resolved about something. He says his goodbyes, his final words to them, then gets up, leaves the castle, and walks towards the center of paths. As he walks, Zeke begins to think to himself, but grudgingly he mocks his father. Sorry, Grisha, but I won't be doing what you want either. Stop, Eren. You think you can just burden me with another mission at the very end? It doesn't even make sense. If you wanted to stop Eren, you'd have never given him the attack titan in the first place. Even to the end, you were full of contradictions. So instead, I'm just going to do what I want. Armin and Hanji follow him, saying, wait, what are you doing? Zeke stands in front of the past tree and looks back. I'm going to play one more game of catch. And we cut back to real time. The real Beast Titan emerges out of paths, breaking off a piece of bone from the top of the Founding Spine. Levi spots him, and thus begins their final duel. Meanwhile, Hanji finds the Titan mouth she's jumped into has disintegrated around her, and Armin and Mikasa are rescued by Falco. It's clear something else has happened in parts after we cut away, because in Armin's hand are two Titan Serum injections. He injects some of it into Falco, passes both to Mikasa, and shows her something written on his hands. Mikasa takes them and flies off. Armin also flies off. Falco flies above the Founding Titan, and Yelena, who's been clinging onto Falco this whole time, spots Zeke as he fights Levi. Using a parachute that was unloaded from the flying boat when they were cutting weight back on the ship, she jumps off Falco and lands nearby Zeke. Zeke, she shouts, what happened? What do we do now? Zeke replies, there is nothing we can do. I'm just trying to enjoy myself. Yelena is baffled, like, you're having fun? The fight continues until Levi wins by forcing Zeke to eject from his Titan. Zeke is helpless, defeated, ready to accept his fate, but he's at peace. Levi rounds the corner, this time aiming for the kill. Yelena only becomes more frustrated as Zeke awaits his fate. Zeke, I don't understand. I dedicated my life to you. What was it all for? Zeke, who had remained calm up until this last line, opens his eyes slightly and starts to think. Finally, Yelena, now getting angry, shouts, Damn it, Zeke, you betrayed me. What did you even do all of this for? Did anything even matter to you? Zeke grimaces in frustrated thought, and then right before accepting death, opens his eyes wide in realization, dodges from Levi's blade at the last second, and makes a desperate run for the head of the Founding Titan. Levi gives chase, but the Elder Titans get in his way. Yelena also follows him, but can't quite catch him. Zeke miraculously makes it all the way to the top of the Attack Titan's head. Levi is almost on top of him again, but he dodges again and grabs a chunk of Eren's hair. He slides down to look into Eren's eyes. Zeke shouts, Grisha! Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I couldn't stop Eren. But, but, you have to promise me that you'll still give the Attack Titan to Eren anyway. Because if you don't, if you don't, I'll have never heard what you said to me. I love you too, Dad. Levi finally takes Zeke's head.
I definitely like the idea of Levi killing Zeke, completing his mission. It's got good spectacle that's very intertwined with his character, but Zeke coming all the way around to a quote, good person is kind of lackluster, not just because it's rather weak logic, but because it's also so far removed from Z the Zeke we know, it doesn't really feel like a Zeke moment as much as a generic redemption moment, which I don't think you need. Because more core to his character wasn't his nihilism, it was actually his daddy issues, <laughs> which is a far more reasonable jump for the character than like, becoming a hero. Also, it's much more personal too. I noticed all the way back in 121, Zeke never said I love you back, which makes sense because he was still hell bent on his mission and he wasn't going to go back on the reasons he did it all when he was so close to victory. But now having lost everything, he finally realizes what really matters to him. And to intertwine it even more, Yelena ended up being the perfect character to inadvertently make him realize that. I'm still so pissed she was left out of this conflict. There was so much potential. And I realized you could intertwine it even more by using the mechanics already established in the narrative for Zeke to make up with his father. No new past shenanigans needed, the attack titan can see the future, Grisha had the attack titan, so Grisha might see Eren's memories of Zeke telling him this. And on top of all of this, I could make a great plot twist out of this, as well as making it make perfect sense to Zeke why this would work. There are theories on this, but Zeke, knowing that Carla would be killed and Grisha doesn't know yet, comments himself that he doesn't know why Grisha gave Eren the attack titan implying it's a mystery. He thinks Eren gave him some other memory from the future, but plot twist, it was actually Zeke. And finally, even though Grisha is a dead character, we can actually give him a moment at the very end. Grisha, after every horrible thing that happened, decides, fuck the world, I'll just give Eren what he wants, because more than anything, I want to make up with a son who I treated so horribly. I'm very proud of this moment, if you can tell. <laughs> anyway, back to the rewrite. Yelena is now even more baffled and frustrated as she watches Zeke's head fall. This was no grand goal. This was all for nothing. Yelena says, I don't understand. What could have been more alluring to you than saving the world? Suddenly, something happens. It's like Paths is glitching. Tormented imagery of Emir flashes in front of the Eldian's eyes. What the fuck was that about? No one knows. Armin then catches up with Levi. They hold in front of Eren's eyes and they observe the rumbling. It didn't stop. Despite Armin knowing this would probably be the case, Armin acts like this is total news to him. Why didn't it work? Armin then orders Levi to rejoin with Falco so he can blow the place up without knowing anyone will get in the way. Noticing Armin's change in tone, Levi follows the order. Armin is nervous as he climbs back up to the top of the head, and we flash back to Hanji and Armin inside Pass right before they were about to leave the same way Zeke did. Hanji's mood seems to change. She says, the truth is they have no idea if this will work, and Armin lightheartedly says, I guess it's a gamble then. And Hanji replies, no. I don't think I'm capable of that. I think we both realized it, didn't we? We couldn't live up to him. Armin says, hey, what are you saying? We've got a plan. But Hanji says, clever plans is all we ever have, and clever plans won't give you the will to transform. Flock was right. We need an Erwin, our own devil. We don't need two naive hopefuls who care way too much. Armin starts to get worried, but Hanji cuts him off. And here is where Hanji appoints him as the new leader of the scouts. Hanji walks past Armin and Armin yells, what are you doing? Hanji, her back turned, says seriously to Armin, awakening the devil. And then turns and with a more lighthearted tone says, oh, this means Levi's your subordinate now. Welcome to the bone and disappears into paths. This was a good line, I wanted to keep it, and honestly a light-hearted final message to everyone is probably more suited to Hanji. We come back to real time. Hanji, who is underneath the Founding Titan, has made her way to the general area they know Eren is hiding. She climbs to the top side and sees Armin on the head, looking apprehensive. Hanji shouts, Armin, the rumbling can be stopped. We can control Ymir through the Titan Shifters. As Hanji says this, a Warhammer Titan forms behind her from one of the nearby spines. It's Eren, moving to silence her at the expense of revealing his exact position. Hanji shouts, I've already done the setup. Everyone needs to transform simultaneously, but the order in their minds needs to be simple. So command the Titans to, and the attack Titan's arms shoot out before she finishes her sentence and crushes the breath from Hanji's lungs. Weakly, Hanji laughs and says, I actually didn't know what comes next. But thanks for proving the theory, Eren. 
All right, so now that it's pretty obvious that I'm killing Hanji, let's talk about her original death. Look, if you're gonna kill major characters, don't do this arbitrary dwindling party shit. Why not have Eren do it directly? Again, you have so much juicy drama to tease out of this. You have comrades, friends who are directly opposed to each other, who both have a higher purpose in spite of that friendship. You have a character who is defined by his desire for freedom and his determination to reach that goal at any cost. That is a motivation well worth crystallizing through your character's actions and proving to your audience just how extreme this conflict is. And what would that do for the drama to see these characters truly try to kill each other and actually cross the point of no return? What would happen next? What would that evoke in the characters? That's exciting! The other thing is this death is actually necessary within the narrative. That is to say, Hanji's death is necessary to get Armin to change. It's not just the writer making an arbitrary situation that coincidentally requires someone to stay behind. Anyway, at this point, Eren's Titan looks intimidating, like the dominating force he's been built up to be, finally making his return. But as Armin stares into his eyes, he starts flashing in and out of path, seeing the Attack Titan's eyes staring at him, then Eren's, then the Attack Titan's, then Eren's, before finally he sees the eyes of Child Eren, his eyes now horrified, blood on his hands, a broken wooden figure of a Survey Corps member in his hands. The attack titan gently lies Hanji on the ground, the hands of his titan shaking. The others scream, Armin and the other shifters start to come in to engage Eren, aiming to break him out of his new revealed location. Ymir's titans in full force come to defend him. Eren and Armin start flashing in and out of pass. Armin sees child Eren at first, but with every flash he gets closer, older and more deranged each time, bloodshot eyes, hair a mess. You came. Why? Why do you have to wake me up from that dream? Eren finally turns into his adult form and puts his hands on Armin. Armin pulls away. As the fight on the back of the founder continues, Eren keeps pulling Armin in and out of paths while talking to him, throwing off his movement. Note, as this fight and conversation goes on, Ymir and Eren push the Alliance further and further away from Eren's real location. There's a lot of Armin outsmarting Eren in this section, and I worry Eren isn't living up to the dominating force he's been. But here, as Eren is pushing Armin back from this location, is probably the point where it should feel like Eren is getting the upper hand. Anyway, as this is happening, Eren and Armin talk. Armin glances at Hanji before telling Eren that this has gone too far. The partial rumbling was meant to destroy the enemy military, not slaughter innocents. He tries to invoke Eren's mother, how he felt when the wall was destroyed. There are good people, innocent families, children, but Eren retorts, don't you think I know that? Of course there are good people out there, people that don't want to harm us, but there's bad people too. If I could target just them, I would, but I can't. But Armin says that was the whole point of the partial rumbling, to take out only what was an immediate threat. But Eren says that it's not that simple and he knows it. The problem isn't the military, it's the people that want to kill us. As long as they exist, they'll rebuild and with their greater numbers and technology, they will outpace us and they will kill us. This is all to say that a partial rumbling doesn't work unless they maintain the founder and make children eat their parents. Armin says, we don't know that, there might have been a better solution. Eren retorts, how convenient for you. As long as you choose to do nothing, cling on to some hopeless bed at peace, you don't have to feel bad because you're not directly hurting anyone. But I won't do it. I will not leave our fate up to chance. Armin says, are you hearing yourself? At the very least, wouldn't the 50 year plan sacrifice less innocence than doing this? Eren retorts, oh, is it that simple? You just boil this down to a mass question? We were open to make peace at any time, but the outside world wouldn't let us. I refuse to sacrifice our people just because they didn't care about theirs. I accept the innocent collateral that comes with killing our enemies. I won't accept sacrificing innocence for the sake of those enemies. It's them or us, Armin. Choose. You don't know that. There's no guarantee of any of this. You don't know how quickly technology will progress. You don't know that the outside world won't change. And you don't know if rumbling this much is required to stop us from being attacked. There's still time to stop, to save innocence. But Eren says, no, I don't. But that doesn't even matter anymore, does it? You had two years at most to find a solution, but now you've killed Zeke. If I lose connection with the founder, there is no longer a way to get back without turning Historia into a Titan. If we stop now, we lose our ability to defend ourselves. So we have to pull the trigger. We have to do something or we're completely defenseless. Fine, then let's be defenseless. As long as there's a chance to talk it out, to avoid this bloodshed, I refuse to pull the trigger. We have to try. Eren sighs and sombers. Don't make me do this, Arvin. I don't want to kill my best friend. 
So a bunch of this dialogue is actually some paraphrasing slash copying from uh, Aotino Requiem, a fan manga of the popular original ending theory. I have varying opinions of this fan project, but this section here with Armin and Eren arguing is exactly the sort of shit I want out of a fight between these two. Really capitalizes on the conflict. One of the big things I'm doing differently is that my Eren isn't the cool, calm, dominating Chad character he has been. I'm not even saying there's anything wrong with that. That aspect of his character was undoubtedly what surged his character popularity. Even before 123 and 131 that added amazing motivation and depth, which surged it even higher. Also, anyone who said you weren't supposed to like this character only changed their minds because the manga changed its mind. The same subreddits who praised the decision to make this Eren a fraud was enraptured by Chad Eren too. You can't fool me, this is consumer bias. You we're always gonna side off on whatever the creator did. That's why the popular AOT subreddits defended lines like this, only to turn around and say it was a good change when the anime signed off on it. All of a sudden it was okay to say the old version was bad, just like Chad Aaron. Face it, Chad Aaron was the first time Aaron was universally loved. You, you loved a main character that ends up as a badass dominating force within the plot. If nothing else, from a purely consumer metric, this is the version of the character that should have been stuck with. Anyway, that's what Aotino Requiem does, but only that's kind of what I'm doing. Reason being is I've realized I could do a few different new versions of Eren that are still connected logically to this Eren, but I can arrange them into an arc. This will keep things fresh and interesting, but still, bear with me, do this character justice in both new additions to his depth and the way he that he's this dominating force in the plot. So first off, this is the more manic version of Eren, which makes sense. This is kind of the first time he's actually killed his friends directly, and after the rumbling, this has taken a massive toll on his mental state, which is why he reverted back to a kid in the first place. But wait for it, it's going to be super cathartic when you see where I'm going with this. Meanwhile, Jean and the other non-shifters rush to Hanji's side and start to bandage her up, bones piercing her side, she coughs up blood, she tells them she's as good as dead, and they have more important things to worry about. Armin is going to blow this place up, and the people on Fort Salta are going to need defense from the Colossals. We need to get every non-shifter on Falco and back to the ground. This is my final order. Armin is the new commander. Go. Now. While Eren and Ymir fight the shifters, the Founder's head looms over Fort Salta, and a number of Colossals have started to move up in front of the Founder and climb up. Jean finally finds a moment and blows up the head, flattening a number of the Colossals and slowing the Founder's movement. Then the non-shifters get on Falco and down to the ground. There's no time for reunions, of course, with family. In fact, the people are cowering inside as the Alliance grab extra leftover supplies from the plane. Hanji is left with Onyonkapon, who keeps trying to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, Falco waits by the base, watching the fight on the Founder, waiting for the signal as the non-shifters start killing the Colossals on Fort Salta. Back on Eren's back, Armin continues his conversation with Eren, and out of the corner of his eye, Reiner appears, snatches Peek away, and out from Eren's view. Which is suspicious, but Eren's too held up to do anything. He's just told Armin that he'll kill him if he has to, but Armin says that he's not sure he will. Clearly, Eren isn't all he's cracked up to be. He didn't finish off Hanji like he should. Eren says, No. She'll die. It's only a matter of time. It causes Armin's eyes to twitch. His anger starts building. What about you, Armin? Can you kill me? All this time you wanted to talk. In fact, you're doing it right now. I don't think you have it in you to go through with this either. Armin replies, You sure about that? Wouldn't be the first time you were wrong about me. Ah, and what was the first? The first time was you thinking this whole thing was just me talking rather than stalling. Armin reveals Hanji tricked him. Ymir helped them and brought both of them into pass beforehand. They already had a plan, and while Armin's been talking, the shifters have been spreading the plan to each other. Eren twitches in anger. He knew that Ymir was helping them since they had their titans, and he reveals he hadn't actually been able to find Ymir since the rumbling started, but he thought he'd fix the problem when he killed Hanji. Eren admits he doesn't know what's going on, but he says that if Armin thinks he understands the founder better than him, he's wrong. Armin is being tricked, but Armin counters that this plan wasn't given to them, they worked it out themselves. We finally flash back to Armin in pass with Hanji right after Zeke left. He stares into the pass tree Zeke left from. If someone goes through that, I assume they go through pass and find their way back to their body in the real world, right? But what happens if something other than a subject of Ymir goes in by itself? Armin tears off a patch of his clothes and throws it in. It disappears. Where do you think it would go if I put my spinal fluid into that? If that's the connection point of paths that all Eldians are connected through, it would spread out and go to every Eldian, right? Including the Colossal Titans. 
Armin starts thinking. He drops to the ground and starts messing with the sand. If Zeke can make a castle and Ymir can make muscle and tissue from this, it must be possible to make anything, right? He manages to make a rudimentary syringe. He passes it to Hanji. They use the syringe to take his spinal fluid and put it into the tree, but says the shifters will need specialized fluid with a different command. Next, we go back to the moment with Armin on Falco after he just coming out of pass. He takes one of two syringes in his hand and puts some of it into Falco and then passes the two syringes to Makasa, and we get to finally see what's in his hands, a message drawn with a knife. Put this in each shifter, tell them to transform when I do, willing themselves to be controlled by me. In hindsight, maybe that... <laughs> Maybe that message could be a bit shorter, or like on his arms, I don't know. Either way, Mikasa reads the message and then flies off with the syringes. Armin does as well. He finds Annie, slices her out from a titan, and when she turns around, like, what the fuck, Armin? Armin kisses her. <laughs> I wasn't gonna do the ship, but then I realized I could do the chainsaw man, it's vomit, but instead, it's spinal fluid! <laughs> Armin explains the plan to Annie, and then flies back to Falco to explain the plan to him. Meanwhile, Mikasa gives the serum to Reiner and explains the plan, and Reiner says Mikasa needs to leave for Armin to have the best chance of transforming, and to leave the serum with him. Mikasa agrees, in fact that was probably what Armin intended. This is why she later goes with Hanji and the rest of the non-shifters down to Fort Salta. Also, I should note that the patch of Armin's clothing that he ripped off is still gone. This is super anal of me, but it's just confirming the exact logic of the past tree for something super late. So you can just ignore this for now, but I suppose right now it's proof that anything thrown into the past tree that isn't an Eldian will be split evenly amongst subjects of Ymir. Anyway, when we come back to the present, Reiner has successfully given Peek the fluid. Everyone is in position, which is what gave Armin the tip off to start revealing the plan. Meanwhile, Hanji hears screams. Protecting Fort Salta isn't going well. That's fine, she didn't want to die in this room anyway. Onyonkapon wants us to stay put, but she pulls herself up with sheer will, coughing up blood, she regears and enters the fray in a way very similar to her original show death. And because she comes in at the last minute, she is much needed backup and saves a bunch of the Alliance members from the Colossals, which gives her a moment alone in the spotlight to solo the Colossal Titans when everyone else is out of gas. Again, as much as I don't like this scene, it's got good spectacle and I don't want to lose that. After taking out a bunch, she flies high into the sky, taking out one's nape on the way up, she surveys the area from up high. We flash back to Armin and Hanji in pass after putting the spinal fluid into the tree. Hanji says that even if they've done all the prep work, they should have an easy order to follow. Stop the rumbling is too abstract. They need something simple and direct to overcome the obfuscation of paths. Hanji thinks to herself, reflecting on all her research with Titans. Meanwhile, in the present, Eren has been pushing all the shifters away from his location. Whatever Armin's plan is, is a one in a million shot that Ymir is not letting him do anything about anyway. But if they blow him up, he's dead for sure, so that's his priority. Eren is shaky, but he's sure he didn't misread Ymir's emotion. She wants the rumbling, and if they had a plan that was actually going to work, Ymir would have done something by now to stop it. The shifters, on the other hand, have been giving up ground until the plan got around but now they want to push again to Eren's location. Eren and Ymir work to stop them, which works, so it forces the Alliance to take Armin and throw him over the Elder Titans and as close to Eren's location as they can get. Whether it's close enough to kill Eren in the explosion is a toss up. It's high up and Ymir's Titans respond by getting in the way, forming a collage of Titans up to him. This was a good visual, so I wanted to recreate it somehow. Visions flash in Armin's mind as he flies, Eren telling Mikasa he hates her, beating him up, the rumbling, and finally Hanji getting crushed and Eren saying that she will die, and that he'll kill Armin too. Armin says, you were right Eren, I can't kill my friends, but maybe I can kill you. He bites his hand. Meanwhile, another colossal falls to Hanji. She looks at the fight from afar and realizes Armin must be close. She reflects on her life, the blood loss finally starting to take her. She says she's sorry to Erwin and Eren. She couldn't be a good commander, and she couldn't find Eren a better solution for peace. She says, I'm sorry, I don't understand devils, and I don't understand people either. She looks over the rumbling, a light smile on her face. But I do understand Titans. Almost deliriously, she stretches out her arms in front of the Titans, welcoming them into her arms. She tenderly says, Sonny, Bean, don't be afraid. I'll come with you so you don't have to be scared. The shine of the Titan Shifters transforming appears from Falco and on the Founder while we see Hanji from the flashback give her solution. The order that needed to be simple to overcome the obfuscation of paths. Close the Colossal's eyes. 
The explosion rings out. All the titans transform and Hanji smiles, satisfied she has achieved her mission. As she looks over all the colossals, closing their eyes together with her. Mikasa, who's been helping kill Colossals, stretches out her arm and screams Eren's name. She was holding out hope that this wouldn't happen. Again, one of the only things I did like about Hanji's desk was this panel here. I'm generally against character deaths at the end that don't achieve anything, but if you're going to do it, they should at least go out in a way that's relevant to the character. Hanji is the crazy titan obsessed character. To make her death climactic, she should go out in a way that reflects that. In that sense, it's good that Hanji goes out fighting titans, and this panel here really emphasizes that. But ultimately, I felt like it was just lip service. It could have been a lot more tangible. Now, actually playing an integral role in stopping the titans by using her crazy titan knowledge, now that's a much better homage to the character. And it's even better emphasized with Hanji being the one character who was sympathetic to titans, dying with them, happily moving on with them so they don't have to be alone. Back to the rewrite. The Colossal begins to slow and stop as the Founder falls into rubble. The Elder Titans disappear, much to Armin's surprise, and the Shifters do their best to survive the collapse. Falco, now transformed, leaves Fort Salta and goes to pick up the other Shifters. They're watching to see if Eren reappears from the massive pile of bones, but he doesn't. When Falco gets back to Fort Salta with everyone on his back, the civilians are starting to come out from their shelter. Everyone is ecstatic to find out their parents are alive and they reunite with them. Like in the show, Karina tells Reiner she's sorry, that this is all she needed, but also that she knows now that Reiner was putting on a brave face, that this is her fault and she should have treated him better. But Reiner denies anything is her fault, and he confesses how guilty he feels over everything, how he's a bad person. She tries to convince him otherwise, but it's not getting through. You're not bad. Your father is bad. He abandoned us, but you've done so much good, tried so hard. But Reiner says it can never outweigh his sins. Karina frustratedly asked if he'd say that in the opposite situation. If you lived your life as a hero, but did one bad thing, would you be allowed to ignore it because your deeds are so great? Reiner doesn't agree, but he thinks to himself, but she's right. Why can't I be proud of anything? But he can't think on it anymore. A titan bolt appears past the plateau. The attack titan rises from the cliffside and Eren pulls himself out and balances on the shoulder using the warhammer to maintain the titan through connection. Eren has bloodshot eyes with bags. His pose is somewhat off, like he's holding himself together. He's clearly stressed after killing Hanji, but he's determined. Mikasa goes to call his name, but Eren's eyes widen in realization as he looks past her. He cuts her off by laughing. In context, it seems like a manic villain laugh, like Kira at the end of Death Note, but the laugh itself doesn't feel sadistic. It feels like relief, like someone who was going crazy with stress, now just releasing that tension. When they look at him unnerved, he says, you haven't realized it yet, have you? You're all so focused on reuniting, you haven't looked around you, have you? And slowly, Eren raises his hand to point behind them. They squint behind them at the horizon as Eren mimics his pose from when there were enemies beyond the sea, but now, beyond the sea, on the cliff, there is only... Titans. A telling steam now begins to rise on the horizon, all but confirming what they're seeing. It hits Armin the hardest. They stopped the rumbling, but they stopped it too late. He failed. He knew it was possible when they saw the Titans top speed on the boat, but they saw the full rumbling and it wasn't going that fast. Eren explains that the rumbling was split into two groups, a densely packed group of fully fleshed Titans who would take out the global alliance that had gathered in Mali, and a second group of much more split up Titans that were much faster and constantly regenerated and let off steam that would take out the rest of the world and its weaker leftover forces. Eren himself admits it was close, he didn't know if he would make it in time, and before his head got blown off, he was closely watching the horizon so he could stop the fight. So, yes, I did the full rumbling. Why? Okay, three reasons. One, it has the most spectacle. Obviously, just like the snap, it would be very underwhelming to build up to a catastrophic event and then not deliver. In the same vein, it cheapens the spectacle of the hypothetical to know that another solution existed. It'd be like Thanos at the end of Endgame being like, oh, <laughs> doy, we could have just doubled the resources. 
two, just like the snap, again, it's unpredictable. It's by far the most unique outcome that most people won't be expecting. Now, granted, you now have to find a new way to end the story that delivers on a new kind of closure as the good guys have just lost, but that's a problem I could solve, you'll see. Three, it actually has very little problems with closure. Remember when I said these characters need to be in a mortal battle for a proper climax, but you can't kill Eren because it fucks his closure, and you can't possibly have him win by killing all the Alliance either because it hurts their closure? Well, here's the solution. You have Eren win before killing the Alliance, and then there's no need to fight. All it costs you is the entire world. But let me ask you a question. Who is more important, 8 billion people or 11 people? Trick question, it's 11 people because these people are named characters and the 8 billion are not. No shit, you kill the 8 billion in a heartbeat. You don't need them for anything. They're not required for closure. Now though, you might be thinking, hold on, that's it? That wasn't much of a mortal battle. You didn't deliver on the spectacle. Ah, uh, hold on. We're not solving the conflict yet though. No, we're reshaping it. And this is just the setup. Many of the Alliance fall to their knees, grappling with the horror of what's happened. But Eren manically says, Oi, don't. This is no time to mourn. We're not done yet. Or have you not looked at their faces? The remaining Malian soldiers look furious. Armin, realizing what he's implying, snaps. His failure and his newfound hatred of Eren boils up inside him. He immediately draws his blade. No, 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 no. You are not doing this. Armin is bloodlusted at this point. Finally, the devil he needs to be, but at what cost? But Connie brings him back to reality. There's still people they can save by avoiding a conflict. As long as that's true, they haven't failed. Armin grimaces and lets it go, reverting back a bit to the old Armin. He talks to Eren. You said it yourself, there's too much of a technological gap and too many numbers, so we couldn't just rely on a single partial rumbling. But that's not the case anymore. Eren says, that depends. What are you going to do? You can't leave them here. You got to bring them back with us where they will kill us in our beds. Armin retorts that that's not true. You still have the Jaegerus. You have all the power. So what's the harm in sparing a couple of lives? But Eren says he'll only live a few more years. He can't burden the children. The old Eldia Empire thought it had all the power too, but the hate festered and grew with each generation. Somewhere down the line, they will secure their revenge. While he says this, he uses his Warhammer power to pull the flying boat up to his level and grabs two spare gas canisters from it before using the Warhammer and hardening to form his own 3D maneuver gear to place them in. So this solves two missed opportunities. A lot of fans were disappointed that the Warhammer was kind of a one and done type plot device that never saw much other use. And I was disappointed that we never got to see adult Eren use ODM gear, which when you think about it would be a great climax for the character to circle back all the way back to season one Titan killer Eren. In fact, just in general, he never got to use ODM gear much. So this should make a nice change of pace with a cool new spin. Shiny blue ODM gear with stretchy fleshy Warhammer coil for the wires. It'd be weird but cool? And you can't say I can't do it. Warhammer makes weapons, even long stretchy parts. The only thing it couldn't do would be the gas, which adds a nice restriction on it, which stops us from retroactively questioning why it wasn't used in other scenes. Although a lot of the time the Warhammer would have been useful, he was out of stamina anyway. Also, if you want to say when he learnt this, you could say it's a tricky practice while either in prison or in paths. Anyway, I digress. So Aaron says that if they take the Malians home, they will eventually take revenge and start the whole thing over again. Armin says, you can't know that. You don't know that. Eren says, again, quite manically, but you don't know what's necessary either. All I know is that we're so close, Armin. What's a few more deaths if it means finally ending this cycle? Finally securing peace? It means everything, yells Armin. I get why you felt like you had to do the rumbling to secure peace, but where's the line? How far are you justified in going for absolute security? This far, nothing more, replies Eren. Are you sure about that? Do you have any idea what Paradise was like when we left? What will you do about the people in Paradise who didn't agree with you? Are they a threat to you? Maybe not now, but in a few years, hate festers, right? When people write about your actions, will you control what they write? This cycle of violence excuse is horseshit. Discord about this is inevitable. Eren goes to speak, but Armin cuts him off. And what if the rumbling wasn't perfect? What if survivors appear in a year? Will you kill them too? Eren starts to retort. If they were a threat, then of course. But how much is a threat, says Armin? What if it wasn't a group of survivors? What if it was just one? What if it was just a child? What if it was just a baby? Baby would never know, Eren bites back. They'd find out eventually. Stop dodging. I want you to draw a line. What is your limit? 
Who won't you kill to secure your precious peace? Eren starts to struggle. Armin, seeing weakness, finally points to the Marlian family that came in on the train. The dad was one of the Marlians making an angry face at Eren before. Armin points to that kid. Come on, Eren, look that kid in the eye and say you have to do this. Eren thinks of Ramsay. He falters, but he says, I can't just stop now, can I? Not when I've come so far. I have a duty to finish this. Whether you kill them or not, it'll make no difference. We'll all go home, be safe for now, and discourse about the rumbling will fester over generations anyway. There's still the Malian prisoners, the volunteers, the Azamabito, even the warriors after all. This path will never end, Eren. But if you give them mercy, treat them better than how the Malians treated Eldians? Hey, we're probably still fester, but... You'll have saved a few lives that wouldn't have mattered anyway. Isn't that worth more? Looking into the child's eyes, Eren, finally, relents. He lets it go, and the group sigh in relief. They can finally go home, and put an end to this. Everyone is in agreement, except one. Every Eldian starts to feel like something is off. A distant rumbling in their heads grows before they're pulled into pass. A little girl stands in the center of the group, and she screams. Just as suddenly all those Eldians are ripped out of pass again, and then they begin to glow. The Marlians try to run, but they're grabbed by some of the Eldians and held there, almost automatically as if they can't control their actions. The only non-Eldians free from this are Onyonkapon and Yelena. Yelena was sitting on the sidelines, and Onyonkapon was much closer to the Alliance, tending to their wounds. So if he got grabbed, he was close enough for one of the Alliance to free him. Reiner looks at his mom. Sorrowfully, she tells him to promise her. Promise me you'll smile, that you'll forgive yourself. I don't want to die thinking I ruined the hopeful, heroic boy that I was so lucky to have. Reiner says he promises before she pulls away from him and steps back. Almost immediately he sees Gabby and Falco refusing to let go of their parents and rushes to drag them away. They scream. Karina gives a somber smile as she sees a hint of the old Reiner. But Reiner thinks to himself, he doesn't believe a word of what he's saying. Also, when Falco is finally dragged away, his desperation turns almost into shell shock. His hearing is dampened and his vision blurs. It's like he shuts down. Something inside him just breaks. I just want to remind you that he already lost his family once and it hit him hard, but now he got them back just to lose them again. Something inside him starts to build. Or perhaps it was building all along. Meanwhile, Annie, similar to Gabby and Falco, can't accept it. Almost manically, she says to her dad, Don't worry, I'll bring you back. I'll find a way. The Titans transform as the Alliance runs away towards the military complex. Surprisingly, Eren in his Titan runs between the Titans and the Alliance and makes a wall with a Warhammer Titan, protecting them. Eren looks unnerved, but relieved. He says, Ymir wanted to kill the Malians to keep it simple. Maybe we can have true peace. He says, Ymir just needs to change the Eldians back, and we can all go home. But they don't change back. Suddenly, everyone except Eren and the non-Eldians wince in pain as a vicious burn begins searing on their chest. Yes, even the Ackermans start burning too. As mentioned before, Ackermans are immune to the Founding Titan, but not Ymir herself. Eren doesn't understand what's happening. Armin, trying to work it out, notices Ymir left untransformed all the combatants. Why? And then it hits Eren. He says, she wants you to struggle, to suffer. That's why her titans never finished you off, why she brought you into pass. That's why she made that absurd flying titan for you. She wanted you to come all this way, to think that you won, only to find out you did it for nothing and slowly burn to death. Armin says, that's why we keep seeing her. She's watching us. That's I bet why Eren didn't stop Zeke's titans. Eren called for it, but Emir lied and didn't do it. Eren confirms it, only now just realizing it for himself. This was another small plot hole fix. In hindsight, I think this was done to keep viewers relevant and keep the chaos and spectacle building, but it's referred to like it's a mystery and it never gets like an answer. Armin says, she's enjoying this. But is this all because we wanted to stop the rumbling? She won, didn't she? The rumbling was successful. Why would she be so spiteful? Eren thinks, says, 
I... I... He trails off. He thinks about what Ymir was like in Paths, a girl imprisoned for thousands of years, and then he thinks about what he was like as a kid when a titan ate his mother. Eren's suffering was just a fraction of hers. Ymir didn't even have a single ally until Eren, and Eren, he saw everything as his enemy, but he changed. He crossed the ocean, slept under his enemy's roof, ate the same food as them, saw that there was good people, but Ymir, Ymir had not. Eren starts to hyperventilate. He says, no, no, it's not just you. She's spiteful to everyone. And he shouts into the sky, Ymir, please tell me you didn't turn the Titans back on Paradis. The Alliance, in horror, finally put the pieces together and tell Eren what they saw on the boat. Titans marching backwards. Eren says, my people, Historia, no. Connie and Jean are both distraught. Both their mothers are dead. Anger starts to build in Jean and Eren. And Yelena, Yelena laughs. She doubles over in laughter. Laughs harder than anyone has ever laughed in the whole series. Everything's fucked. Nobody got what they wanted, but it's like divine retribution for her. The euthanasia plan was the correct choice all along. She's so happy she decided to see this through to the end. So now that the twist is revealed, let's talk about Ymir. I love kids, given godlike power. I think I might have had left too much of a gap. <laughs> but it's probably my favorite character trope. Not only does it have innate irony in something with a weak association given something with a strong association, but it also gives you all the plot influence and impact of a big bad with all the unpredictable plot turns, unique aesthetics, and shenanigans of a wildcard character who usually play a much smaller role in the story. And it all comes with a free pass to make unpredictable plot twists because a kid can use any number of warped logical leaps to make choices in the plot because it's a kid. I suppose technically Ymir isn't actually a child, but she's like emotionally and intellectually stunted and her physical form is a reflection of that. Ymir was such a late input into the story, but I thought she had amazing potential. Making Eren dependent on her not only made her an amazing moment for Eren where only he, with his focus on freedom, was capable of getting through to her, but it instantly made her character interesting and important in the story. The rumbling is her choice as much as it is Eren, and it makes her this terrifying force of nature that not even Eren can control. And she's the perfect representation of the themes of the story, the cycle of revenge. She is by far the biggest victim in the story, but at the same time, she's the biggest perpetrator in the story. And I think this could have been so much better realized by having her and Eren show that difference in a big way. And so, game-breaking plot twist number two, Paradis was destroyed. Armin tries to talk to Ymir as Eren mourns. He yells into the sky with no avail, using any angle he can think of. Eren, who this entire time after killing Hanji has looked like a wreck, who has hands that have been shaking any time he's considered killing his friends, clenches his fist and steals himself as he puts back on the mask he wore at the restaurant. Amon tries yet another angle talking to Ymir, but this time, now Eren bursts out in a vicious, manic laughter, much to Yelena's surprise. You can't talk her out of this. She was enslaved by Eldians, forced to build titans out of sand with her bare hands in a time stop world for 2,000 years. No, a million more like it. Every time you or I called on her, you reinforced that. You think you can just reverse all that with a few words? Armin asks why Eren isn't being burned, to which he replies, I gave her a choice. Then you can talk to her, replies Armin. That doesn't mean she's loyal to me, says Eren. She was determined to bury Paradis despite what I wanted. That should make it obvious enough. Eren laughs. Even before that, she betrayed me almost immediately with Zeke's Titans to get any amount of revenge she could. You think I can reason with that level of hate? Armin keeps at it, but Eren cuts him off and shouts to the sky, Ymir, please, I don't want this. But the burns on the Alliance suddenly start to accelerate. The pain worsens. See? She doesn't want us to talk. Armin keeps trying, but Eren cuts him off. Oh, please. Talk, talk, talk. That's all you want to do. When has that ever worked for you, let alone now? The commander back in Trost, he was desperate to fire that cannon at the subject of his hate. Your words meant nothing. What about Annie? What about Bertolt? How do you get that flying boat from Flock, huh? Did talking work then? They don't answer. No, you had to kill him for it. No, it's never worked, and it won't work now. The only reason we're here now is because talking didn't work. We could not overcome that level of hate by talking. And yet you keep trying, and people keep dying. 
Maybe it was you who killed Hanji. Armin grimaces. The pain exacerbates his anger and it takes him. Armin says, okay, new plan. Paradise is destroyed, right? There's no Eldian baby for the founder to go to, right? That's what happened when Zeke died, isn't it? That piece of Emir had nowhere to go. So what happens if we kill the founder instead? End Eren, end Paths, end Emir's influence. Eren says, there we go. That's the conclusion she wanted you to reach. Reiner objects. Hey, Amun, this isn't like you. I is this it? Eren isn't even threatening anyone this time. We're just going to hunt him down and risk all our lives too? It's the founder that's the issue, isn't it? You don't have some kind of clever plan? Amun says, why? Eren's right. If we want to live, we need to make sacrifice. If I had just accepted that earlier, maybe this wouldn't have all been for nothing. Amun screams in anger, drawing his blade. Armin's brief foray into his old self was rewarded just as badly as it was previously, and so he lets his anger return in full force. And so, here's how we reshape the conflict now that the rumbling is completed. A final fight to the death at the end of the world when everything is already lost. It allows us all the climax and spectacle of a full rumbling without having to end the fighting itself anticlimactically with the alliance just being too late. And so, the tension rises. But then, it's broken by Annie, who quietly walks over to Eren and joins his side. She explains that if Armin's plan works, they won't be able to turn her dad back. She has no choice. She has to capture one of them alive and feed them to her dad. And the burn on Annie's chest subsides. Side note, as they talk, Eren will begin to make another set of ODM gear with the Warhammer Titan and that will go to Annie. So, okay, remember when I said if you're making an alliance, you never want to hive mind them, and I'd be doing more of that? This is what I meant. There's actually a couple more instances of this as we go on, but this is the biggest. Pete going for the kill on Eren against the wishes of the rest of the alliance was cool, but a full-on side switch really shakes up the plot. It also solves a lot of my and other people's issues with Annie. When I saw this line from Annie, I'd do it all again. I was excited. This felt like Chekhov's shotgun, but instead it turned out to be more of a... Chekhov's butter knife, with Annie choosing not to get on the flying boat and help the Alliance, and then changing her mind after like two sentences from Kiyomi being like, well, I wouldn't do it all over again, and it's just, it's just kind of lackluster. I suppose it's a little bit of character development too, but only specifically of an opinion that was only just established recently and crystallized with actions that you never fully got the consequences for. Annie's temporary absence from the Alliance basically meant nothing. Furthermore, a lot of people take issue with Annie not suffering any sort of consequence, and while I think it makes sense within the story for her to not as part of the Alliance, putting her back into the antagonist role is going to allow us to give this much more leverage to make a significant arc out of this, with Annie reverting back to her old self and forcing her to weigh her dad against her newer bonds, and suffer consequences directly because of that, rather than some sort of divine judgement from the author. So Annie switches sides, and Falco, who's been quiet till now, is in disbelief. Oi, you're not the only one who's lost someone. You're gonna let everyone here die just to save one life? Sorry kid, says Annie. Maybe that one life just means more to me than anyone you lost. And suddenly, the rage that's been building in Falco boils over. You selfish bitch. Sophia, Udo, Colt, Mom, Dad, Porco, Magath, my country, my people. I've lost more than any of you. I've been betrayed, manipulated, fed to a titan, given false hope, had it stripped away. I did everything I could and kept going, kept trying to be good. I didn't come to the ends of the world to say total strangers just to watch you be so selfish, I'll kill you. Gabby looks on in shock, like looking at a mirror of the past. It breaks her heart, powerless to do anything. But with no other answers, she grimaces and lets herself get swept along with Falco into the conflict. Eren laughs, the brats got you there, but if you're looking for selflessness, you're out of luck, especially among them. At this point, Eren begins chewing out the Alliance, mirroring his rant in the restaurant, being almost uncharacteristically mean, like he's trying to work himself up. The tension rises with each one. You think you banded with the heroes? He points to Levi. Notice how Shorty there has been so quiet? It's because he lost his reason for being here the second he killed Zeke. That was all he was here for. Selfishness. Levi twitches in anger. Jean goes to interrupt him, but Eren speaks over him. Ah, Horseface here! If it wasn't for me guilting him into it, he'd probably be living comfortably among the military police watching your people get squashed. I bet he's only here now because he's being pulled along by that same guilt, not because he actually thinks this was smart or right. Jean yells back. Reiner tries to get him to calm down, but Eren cuts him off. 
At least Jean's better than his best friend. You said you got fed to a titan? Sounds like you already know what Baldy is like deep down. But now Mommy's dead, I suppose he just wants revenge. Ironic coming from a miserable traitor. Reiner turns to Connie to get him to calm down. But much to his surprise, Connie is silent, melancholic. It seems like he's the only one who's internalized the conversation with Reiner in the flying boat. Eren continues, Speaking of miserable traitors, who could forget the cart titan? First time I met her, she ran and abandoned Bertolt, and the second time she immediately tried to turncoat. Did that brat ever tell you that? He says, pointing at Gabby. She'd probably do the same now, but the coward doesn't have as clear odds this time. Everyone is progressively getting more and more pissed at Eren, but Reiner interrupts him. Hey, let's stop this. Eren, this isn't like you. I know this isn't you. And what would you know? You don't even know who you are. I don't even know who you are. Was there even a shred of the real you in your soldier persona? Or was all you ever were that miserable puddle that kneeled before me begging for forgiveness and wanting to die your pathetic? And to this, Reiner's eyes widen and he draws his blades too. The others react like, hey, weren't you trying to be the calm one? And Reiner says he's just realized Eren doesn't mean what he says. What he's doing is stealing himself. He's going to strike first. The others put their hands on their blades, getting ready, but Mikasa, after hearing Reiner's theory, calls out to Eren. He snaps back, I thought I already told you to shut up, slave. I've already said everything I needed to say to you. Did you not get the message last time? I hate you. And immediately Mikasa shoots back with, I love you. And it breaks Eren's mask. He pulls back, silent for the first time, genuine shock on his face. Mikasa says, if I had told you back then, if I had chose a different answer, would it have changed this outcome? Eren's expression goes from shock, to sadness, to remorse, to somber, and then an eerie calm. His manic and stressed state of mind, and even his grimmest determination, is replaced with serenity, acceptance. At peace, Eren draws his blades and says, Yeah. He clicks the trigger and rushes the alliance. The others move to kill him. Mikasa moves to grab him. She makes contact and memories flood her brain. We don't see what they are though, but we see her shock and tears. Eren immediately gets his legs sliced up, but he knew that. He switches to guard his neck, and then once he's almost through the line, he transforms, slides next to the flying boat, picks it up, and throws it over the alliance to Annie so she can grab gas. Seeing what she's doing, some of the alliance go for her. Peek tries to transform, but it doesn't work. The attack titan screams and rushes them, drawing their attention, but it's another fake out. Eren ejects from his titan and uses his 3D maneuver gear to bust into the military complex. Some of the alliance, including Levi, follows and start a small skirmish, but not before telling Mikasa to do something about Annie. Quick as lightning, Mikasa evaluates her order. Instead of going for Annie, she climbs the Warhammer wall, blocking off the pure titans, and finds and goes directly for Annie's dad. But somehow, Annie, who shouldn't be this fast, clashes with her in midair, stopping her. Annie knocks her away, transforms into the female titan, and screams to attract the titans. She smashes through the wall, runs past the military complex as Eren busts out the window, latches onto Annie, and they both start sliding down the cliff with the pure titans now following. Armin calls out and stops them from following. They need a plan. Jean, Connie, and Levi, who chased Eren, are blindsided. They've never seen Eren move like that. Mikasa comments the same with Annie. Levi has a theory. Ymir has made them Archimans. Armin confirms, Ymir wants Eren to win. You can expect she'll pull out bullshit like this. Thankfully, she also wants us to struggle and suffer, so we might still be able to catch her off guard and kill Eren before she realizes it's happening. Unfortunately, they could probably only transform freely this whole time because Ymir was letting them. But the Alliance still has all of Armin's spinal fluid, so Armin says we might be able to transform and use our Titan powers if we work together. With certain orders, we should be able to outweigh Ymir's will, especially after Zeke died. Firstly, the Alliance test the theory. They stand back from Falco, but together with each other to take advantage of the subconscious unwillingness to actually transform. And then they bite their hands, willing Falco to transform. It works, but Armin warns them because they have to do it together, once even one of them takes a serious injury, they won't have the stamina to use their power. Meaning together they'll only have a minority of Emir, and none of them will be able to transform or even regenerate. Any injury they take in this fight will be permanent. The Alliance need to pick a decisive point to summon all their Titans before they can get injured and strike all at once. Particularly, they need somewhere they can use 3D maneuver gear. Armin says that Eren's heading towards the Wall of Colossal Titans. He'll probably use the Warhammer to cross the ocean and climb the cliff. We'll strike there. 
They ask why Eren would give them that opportunity, and Armin says it's because Annie wants to feed one of them to her dad. She'll want to fight at some point, so they're gonna let this burn weaken us first and bait us into a fight later. They're promising us we'll have that opportunity by going that way. Worst case scenario, we'll drop the Heart Titan and Armor Titan on either side to force them towards the sea. Mikasa is silent, and Reiner is apprehensive. Reiner says yet again, Hey, is this really what it comes down to? We're just gonna slaughter each other? And Armin says, Well, if you've got any better ideas, I'm all ears. And Reiner's like, Normally you're the clever idea guy, aren't you? Well, I'm out of ideas, aren't I? Are you coming or not? Reiner, in a moment of clarity, utters, Hey, Eren's words, that burn, a failure to stop the rumbling, Aren't... aren't you all losing your heads a bit? Armin looms over Reiner, the aspect of the devil. Armin says, are you coming? Or are you just going to let Gabby and Falco burn to death? Reluctantly, Reiner submits. Mikasa looks back and forth between Reiner and Armin, trying to make up her mind between who is right. The burn worsens, forcing them to hurry up. They mount the flying titan and go. Yelena and Onyonkapon jump on too. Yelena is determined to see this through. She's been lapping up all the drama, and Onyonkapon has grabbed a first aid kit from the plane. He says to Reiner, for what it's worth, I think you're right. But if you're going to slaughter each other anyway, I'll do what I can to save who I can. Reiner thanks him. I might take a quick moment to describe the location of our final battle in more detail before we get there. It's the cliff across the sea that Eren pointed to, which is sort of a little weird for there to be a cliff of another continent within vision and titan walking distance, but this could also just be an island that just happened to be the last place the rumbling needed to hit. But this is where our final fight takes place, along a cliffside facing an ocean lined with these unmoving gaunt colossals. Depending on where the fight is, as we move along the wall, we can have a whole bunch of different visuals. The water below can have rocks and a sea of blood out to a certain point where people have jumped, and the land, depending on how close the titans are together at this point, can be a floor of blood and corpses as the titans have started to group back up near the center, meaning the alliance literally have to fight surrounded by their failure and Eren his actions. Or, as you get further out, the titans are less steppy and more steamy, which means you can keep some of the infrastructure on this island, sometimes giving an under destroyed but cooked building or tower for our ODM to go through and spice things up if ODMing around just frozen colossals gets boring. Alright, back to the rewrite. Meanwhile, Eren talks on Annie's shoulder. He's no longer shaking or manic or putting up a front. He's calm, the wind blows through his hair and he breathes deeply. Eren says he realized something. Remember when you chased me through the forest? Murdering survey corps without a second thought? Annie winces. Eren says, Captain Levi called me the monster. But he was right. It just took me this long to realize it. No. I knew before, I just only now accepted it. I always said that if someone tried to take my freedom, I wouldn't hesitate to take theirs. But I never considered what I'd do in a situation like this. The very friends I wanted to protect are coming to kill me. It'd be easy to give up my life for them. After all, I only have four years left. And yet, my body moves. The truth is, Historia, the kid, my friends, Paradis, the cycle of violence, these were all the reasons I told myself that I was doing this for, but I don't know anymore if they were excuses. Because now I know that even if it was just me, even if it was only for four more measly years of life on a barren, unpopulated world, I do it all over again. I don't know what's right anymore, and yet. The moment is broken by Annie looking back. The Alliance is here. Armin, with a dark look, tells Connie and Jean to go in first. They're both unnerved. Armin is using them as fodder. Jean grits his teeth. His anger at Eren has boiled over after Hanji, Sasha, and his mother have died because of him. His character has regressed, forgotten what he's learnt. He shares his anger to Connie, expecting him to reciprocate, but Connie just says, Jean? This sucks. Jean is unnerved. The atmosphere becomes foreboding, but they steal themselves. Meanwhile, Reiner asks himself if they're really going to go through with this. Can he go through with this? But it's time to go. Eren and Annie have crossed the sea with the Warhammer Titan and are now at the Wall of Titans. They stab Falco, jump from him, the shifters transform, then their Titans land. Reiner lands past the Wall of Colossals and forces Annie to run along the cliff. The Cart Titan lands behind Annie. Mikasa struggles, her head throbs, the memories she saw are pushing her to do it, but she can't, she just can't. But then, the pain of the burn overwhelms her, and it makes her realize something. 
Of course, she thinks. If I don't do this, I'll die. Meanwhile, Eren stretches out his arms, breathes deeply, and smiles with the wind on his face. Perhaps that's why I'm so calm. I'm thankful, really. This has all become so simple. After all, Gabby fires a shot at Eren that misses, but it throws him off. Connie, Jean, Levi, and Mikasa all rush Eren. Mikasa and Eren begin to chant to themselves, If you win, you live. If you lose, you die. Annie does her best to protect Eren, but it's overwhelming. Jean and Connie provide an opening, and Levi goes for the neck. But Eren's neck crystallizes ahead of time, breaking his blade. Emir is messing with the fight. Once the attack is finished, the crystals shatter immediately so Eren can move his neck again. But Eren is still thrown off by the blow, though, and while Jean, Connie, and Levi are recovering from their strikes, Mikasa Mikasa and Eren enter a brutal duel. With each glancing blow, they reposition themselves and both chant. If you don't fight, you can't win. Fight! 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 Their blades lock on the final chant. Okay, okay, you can't tell me that a Tadakai battle between Eren and Mikasa isn't hype as shit. Do, do you see what I mean when I say not having these characters be in Mortal Kombat is an anti-climax? There's so many missed opportunities. Fuck the twist Kogias ending where one side was never really trying. What a waste. There was so much juicy drama to milk out of this. Especially with Mikasa and Eren. Attack on Titan was never the type of show to give you an idea of something at the start and then have it still be true by the end. The idea that this was ever going to be the type of show with a main female character starts Starts off being in love with the main character and just gets that affirmed at the end is so much less interesting than going lovers to true enemies instead, which is even backed by interviews that were later contradicted. Mikasa's whole arc was about seeing the real Eren, but, but not yet. The blades scrape off each other as they both toss their heads to the side to dodge lethal blows, only when the blades go through their hair, a chunk of Mikasa's hair is sliced to pieces, but Eren's hair glides gently around the blade. She's still holding back, and what's worse, Mikasa's realized that Eren is really going for it. She tears up realizing that Eren is really trying to kill her. Mikasa thinks back again, what version of Eren had I been seeing? They all follow up and go straight for Eren, but the crystals block them, and Annie nearly kills them. Reiner thinks, this isn't really going to happen, right? They're holding back, right? They realize it and stop this madness. But as Mikasa sees her hair and realizes Eren's really going for it, Reiner sees the expression on her face and realizes it too. Jean, Levi, and Connie pull back a bit and land on the cart time. Armin, who's been watching the fight from Falco, draws his blade, jumps at Eren, and shouts, Switch plans, go for Annie's dad. But the second they change target, suddenly Eren sidesteps Mikasa and rushes them, completely ignoring Armin and trusting Annie to stop him, which he does. Realizing a moment too late what Eren is doing, Reiner sprints towards the cart titan, jumps with his own, and then in mid-air pulls out of his titan and uses his ODM gear to close the distance as fast as possible, but it's too late. Connie was the last one to leave the cart titan in the direction of Annie's dad. He's singled out. And Eren, with that eerily calm expression, he takes Connie's head. Gone is the Eren whose hand shook when he killed Hanji. His conviction is steeled. It's kill or be killed. Reiner is only fast enough to catch Connie's body and fall to the ground. All hell breaks loose. In a rage, Jean turns around, rushes Eren, but Levi focuses on Annie's dad, forcing Annie to throw off Armin and Mikasa and turn around and dive into the crowd of pure titans, thus creating a giant messy scuffle that everyone gets drawn into. Which is actually going to allow us to tick off a couple of different scenes I want to go through without needing to pay too much attention to character position continuity. And so, this is the arc I wanted to take Eren along. From putting up a mask and pretending he doesn't care about what's going to happen, to denial, to tortured but determined killer wrestling with what he's doing, and then finally a brief foray back into the mask until finally true acceptance of who he is and the terrifying serenity that comes with it. You know what line actually bothered me the most before his retcon? This one, about the cycle of revenge, because I don't think it's necessary. It even plays into the idea of Yelena's saving the world speech. The idea of Eren being reverse Thanos, the counterpoint of for the greater good, one's right to their own life at the expense of the greater good, that's what I was born into this world meant to me. And so knowing that, I think this is the best place to take his character. Just like Thanos, it's to the absolute extreme. What if you had no other reason? No excuse you could point to? What if it was just you versus the world? What if it was just you versus your friends? And the most exciting, interesting, and logically consistent answer this character could give at this moment is I choose me. And we crystallize it with Eren accepting this and finally killing one of his friends without a second 
thought. This is Eren's final form, and not only does it make good on making him the dominating and terrifying antagonist he's become, but also gives us his final character conflict, because no matter what happens after this, the genie isn't going back in the bottle. He will always know what he is, what he's capable of, if anything, even the people he loves, gets in the way of his freedom. And that is the end of part one. But believe it or not, part two is actually done. This whole rewrite is finished. It's fully edited. It's ready to be released. Uh, here's my issue though. Copyright has been a nightmare for this video. Even this one that I've already released. Th this one, it's claimed. I'm literally not going to see any money from this until we've gone through a whole dispute process that could take like two months because like most companies wait the whole ass 30 day time limit before they reject the dispute. And then they have to say no fuck you again and dispute their rejection and then wait like the max 30 days again. And then they either have to drop it or take me to court. So there's a small chance I'd never even see this money. And even if they do drop it, I get paid monthly. So at most I'll be waiting like three months to see any of this, which is not an option. Cause like I haven't uploaded in like a year cause the last three years my depression got way worse. And now I have insomnia, which makes writing fucking impossible. Cause my mood is so shitty that every idea feels shit. And I can't separate my bad ideas, from my good ideas and evaluate my work, which is why I'm so fucking behind on everything. I'm sorry, patrons, I will make it up to you. I'm finally starting to work out what causes it, which is why this video even came out. Thank you three year long Lenina that blotted out the sun and perfectly coincided with my insomnia. Anyway, I tried to butcher up my work by like cutting up clips to solve issues, but motherfucking YouTube only shows me one copyright infringement at a time. So I have to repeatedly export and upload a three and a half hour video, which takes hours and I can't speed run it in 30 minute sections because then half the copyright issues magically disappear. But I'm not uploading like seven 30 minute parts so I can get smited by three manual copy strikes all at once either and terminate my fucking channel. It's also ugly and I don't want to do it. So new plan, okay. I want to try a crowdfunded pay for release model, which is actually something I've always wanted to try. I even talked about it in my copyright video. In the description is a Ko-Fi and a Bitcoin address. Once I get 1,800 USD, I'll make the second part public, which will still take like 48 hours. It's part of the dispute process, but other than that, it should be immediate. I understand 1,800 is pretty high, but I don't want to undershoot it because once it's out, I lose all my leverage. But also that number is what I negotiated for my last sponsor, which I say because if this works out, I'll just completely replace all sponsors on my channel with this. So like at least they'll you'll get like something out of this. I might also consider doing like an ad free upload since the algorithm's still going to recommend the one with ads anyway. All right, that's all. Uh, hopefully I'll see you uh, with the next one and a half hours of rewrite soon.